The Antichrist Preface This book belongs to the select few. Perhaps none of them even live yet. They may be those who understand my Zarathustra. How could I confound myself with those for whom ears are growing at present? It is only the day after tomorrow that belongs to me. Some are born posthumously. The conditions under which a person understands me, and then necessarily understands, I know them only too accurately. He must be honest in intellectual matters to the point of sternness, in order even to endure my seriousness, my passion. He must be accustomed to live on mountains, to see the wretched ephemeral gossip of politics and national egotism beneath him. He must have become indifferent. He must never ask whether truth is profitable or becomes a calamity to him. A strong preference for questions for which no one has the courage nowadays. The courage for the forbidden, the predetermination for the labyrinth. An experience out of seven solitudes. New ears for new music, new eyes for the most distant a new conscience for truths which have hitherto remained dumb, and the will for economy in the grand style, to keep together one's power, one's enthusiasm, reverence for oneself, love for oneself, unconditional freedom with respect to oneself. Well then, those alone are my readers, my rightful readers, my predetermined readers. Of what account are the rest? The rest are merely mankind. One must be superior to mankind in force, in loftiness of soul, in contempt. One. Friedrich Nietzsche Let us look one another in the face. We are Hyperboreans. We know well enough how much out of the way we live. Neither by land nor by water shalt thou find the way to the Hyperboreans. Pindar already knew that of us. Beyond the north, beyond ice, beyond death, our life, our happiness. We have discovered happiness. We know the way. We have found the exit from entire millennia of labyrinth. Who has found it besides? Modern man, perhaps. I do not know out or in. I am whatever does not know out or in, sighs modern man. We were ill from that modernism, from lazy peace, from cowardly compromise, from the whole virtuous uncleanness of modern yes and no, that tolerance and largeur of heart which forgives all because it understands all, is Sirocco to us, better to live in the ice than among modern virtues and other south winds. We were brave enough. We spared neither ourselves nor others, but we did not know for a long time where to direct our bravery. We became gloomy. We were called fatalists. Our fate, that was the fullness, the tension, the damming up of our forces. We thirsted for lightning and for achievement. We were furthest removed from the happiness of weaklings, from resignation. A tempest was in our atmosphere. The nature which we embody was darkened, for we had no path. The formula of our happiness, a yes, a no, a straight line, a goal. What is good? All that increases the feeling of power, the will to power, power itself, in man. What is bad? All that proceeds from weakness. What is happiness? the feeling that power increases, that a resistance is overcome. Not contentment, but more power. Not peace at any price, but warfare. Not virtue, but capacity. Virtue in the Renaissance style, virtu, virtue free from any moralic acid. The weak and ill-constituted shall perish, first principle of our charity and people shall help them to do so. What is more injurious than any crime? Practical sympathy for all the ill-constituted and weak. Christianity.
The problem which I raise here is not what is to replace mankind in the chain of beings. Man is an end, but what type of man we are to cultivate, we are to will as the more valuable, the more worthy of life, the more certain of the future. This more valuable type has existed often enough already, but as a happy accident, as an exception, never as willed. It has rather just been the most feared. It has hitherto been almost the terror. And out of that terror, the reverse type has been willed, cultivated, attained, the domestic animal, the herding animal, the sickly animal man, for the Christian. Mankind does not represent a development of the better, the stronger, or the higher, in the manner in which it is at present believed. Progress is merely a modern idea, that is, a false idea. The European of today is, in worth, far below the European of the Renaissance. Onward development is by no means, by any necessity, elevating, enhancing, strengthening. In another sense, there is a continuous success of individual cases in the most different parts of the earth, and from the most different civilizations, in which, in fact, a higher type manifests itself, something which, in relation to collective mankind, is a sort of superman. Such happy accidents of grand success have always been possible, and will perhaps always be possible. And even entire races, tribes, and nations can, under certain circumstances, represent such a good hit. We must not embellish or dress up Christianity. It has waged a deadly war against this higher type of man. It has banned all fundamental instincts of this type. It has distilled evil, the evil one, out of these instincts. Strong man as the typical reprobate, as outcast man. Christianity has taken the part of everything weak, low, ill-constituted. It has made an ideal out of the antagonism to the preservative instincts of strong life. It has ruined the reason even of the intellectually strongest natures in that it taught men to regard the highest values of intellectuality as sinful, as misleading, as temptations. The most lamentable example, the ruin of Pascal who believed in the ruin of his intellect by original sin, while it had only been ruined by his Christianity. It is a painful and thrilling spectacle that has presented itself to me. I have drawn back the curtain on the depravity of man. This word in my mouth is, at all events, guarded against one suspicion, that it involves a moral accusation of man. It is, I should like to underline it once more, meant in the sense of freedom from any moralic acid, and this to the extent that that depravity is felt by me most strongly just there, where one hitherto most consciously aspired to virtue and divinity. I understand depravity. One makes it out already, in the sense of decadence. My assertion is that all values in which mankind now compromise their highest desirability are decadence values. I call an animal, a species, an individual, depraved when it loses its instincts, when it selects, when it prefers what is harmful to it. A history of higher sentiments, of ideals of mankind, and it is possible that I shall have to tell it again, would almost also be the explanation for why man is so depraved. Life itself I regard as instinct for growth for continuance, for accumulation of forces, for power. Where the will to power is lacking, there is decline. My assertion is that this will is lacking in all the highest values of mankind, that values of decline, nihilistic values, hold sway under the holiest Seven. names. Christianity is called the religion of sympathy. Sympathy stands in antithesis to the tonic passions which elevate the energy of the feeling of life. It operates depressively. One loses force by sympathizing. The loss of force which suffering has already brought upon life is still further increased and multiplied by sympathy. Suffering itself becomes contagious through sympathy. 
Under certain circumstances, a total loss of life and vital energy may be brought about by sympathy, such as stands in an absurd proportion to the extent of the cause, the case of the death of the Nazarene. That is the first point of view. There is, however, one still more important. Supposing one measures sympathy according to the value of the reaction which, as a rule, it brings about, its mortally dangerous character appears in a much clearer light still. Sympathy thwarts, on the whole, in general, the law of development, which is the law of selection. It preserves what is ripe for extinction. It resists in favour of life's disinherited and condemned ones. It gives to life itself a gloomy and questionable aspect by the abundance of the ill-constituted of all kinds whom it maintains in life. One has dared to call sympathy a virtue. In every superior morality it is regarded as a weakness. One has gone further. One has made it the virtue, the basis and source of all virtues. Only, to be sure, which one must always keep in mind, from the point of view of a philosophy which was nihilistic, which inscribed the denial of life on its escutcheon. Schopenhauer was right in maintaining that life was denied by sympathy, was made worthier of denial. Sympathy is the practice of nihilism. To repeat, this depressive and contagious instinct thwarts those instincts which strive for the maintenance and elevation of the value of life. It is, both as the multiplier of misery and as the conservator of all misery, a principal tool for the advancement of decadence. Sympathy persuades to nothingness. One does not say nothingness, one says, instead, the other world, or God, or true life, or nirvana, salvation, blessedness. This innocent rhetoric, out of the domain of religio-moral idiosyncrasy, at once appears much less innocent when one understands what tendency here wraps the mantle of sublime expressions around itself, the tendency hostile to life. Schopenhauer was hostile to life, therefore sympathy became a virtue to him. Aristotle, as is known, saw in sympathy a sickly and dangerous condition, which one did well, now and then, to get at by a purgative. He understood tragedy as a purgative. From the instinct of life, one should, in fact, seek an expedient to put a puncture in such a morbid and dangerous accumulation of sympathy as the case of Schopenhauer shows. And, alas, also, our entire literary and artistic decadence from St. Petersburg to Paris, from Tolstoy to Wagner, so that that bubble might burst. Nothing in our unhealthy modernism is more unhealthy than Christian sympathy. To be a physician here, to be pitiless here, to apply the knife here, that belongs to us. That is our mode of charity. With that we are philosophers, we Hyperboreans. It is necessary to say whom we regard as our antithesis, theologians, and everything that has theological blood in its veins, our entire philosophy. One must have seen the fatality close at hand, or better still, one must have experienced it in oneself. One must have been almost ruined by it, to regard it no longer as a jocular affair. The free thinking of our naturalists and physiologists is a joke in my eyes. They lack passion in these matters, they do not suffer from them. That poisoning extends far wider than one supposes. I discovered the theological instinct of haughtiness everywhere where people at present regard themselves as idealists, where, in virtue of a higher origin, they assume the right to cast superior and strange looks at actuality. The idealist, precisely like the priest, has all the great concepts in his hand, and not only in his hand. He plays them with a benevolent contempt against the understanding, the senses, honours, good living, and science. He sees these things as beneath him, as harmful and seductive forces over which spirit soars in pure self-sufficiency, as if submissiveness, chastity, poverty, 
in a word, holiness, had not hitherto done unutterably more injury to life than any frightful things or vices. Pure spirit is pure lie. As long as the priest, this denier, calumniator, and poisoner of life by profession, still passes for a higher species of human being, there is no answer to the question. What is truth? Truth has already been reversed when the conscious advocate of nothingness and denial passes for the representative Denial. of truth. I make war against this theological instinct. I have found traces of it everywhere. Whoever has theological blood in his veins is from the very beginning ambiguous and disloyal with respect to everything. The pathos which develops from this calls itself belief closing one's eye once and for all with respect to oneself so as not to suffer from the sight of incurable falsity. Out of this erroneous perspective towards all things, a person makes a morality, a virtue, a sanctity for himself. He unites the good conscience to the false mode of seeing. He demands that no other mode of perspective is any longer of value, after he has made his own sacrosanct with the names of God, salvation, and eternity. I have dug out the theologian instinct everywhere. It is the most widespread, the most peculiarly subterranean form of falsity that exists on earth. What a theologian feels to be true must be false. One almost has a criterion of truth in this. It is his most fundamental instinct of self-preservation, which forbids reality to be held in honour, or even to find expression on any point. Wherever the influence of the theologian extends, the judgment of value is turned on its head. The concepts of true and false are necessarily reversed. What is most harmful to life is here called true. What raises, elevates, affirms, justifies, and makes it triumph is called false. If it happens that, through the conscience of princes, or of the people, theologians stretch out their hand for power, let us not doubt what always takes place in reality. The will to the end, the nihilistic will, seeks power. Among Germans it is immediately understood when I say that philosophy is spoiled by theological blood. The Protestant clergyman is the grandfather of German philosophy. Protestantism itself is its original sin. Definition of Protestantism The half-sided paralysis of Christianity And reason One has only to utter the words College of Tübingen to comprehend what German philosophy is in reality. Insidious divinity The Swabians are the best liars in Germany. They lie innocently. Why the exaltation all over the German academic world, three-fourths of which is composed of the sons of clergymen and teachers, on the appearance of Kant? Why the German conviction, which even now still finds its echo, that with Kant a change for the better commenced? The theologian instinct in German scholars realized what was now possible once more. A backdoor path to the old ideal now stood open. The concept of a true world, the concept of morality as the essence of the world, these two most virulent errors that exist, were again, thanks to a wily, shrewd scepticism, if not demonstrable, at least no longer refutable. Reason, the prerogative of reason, does not reach so far. An appearance had been made out of reality, a world completely fabricated by a lie, the world of what is had been made reality. The success of Kant is merely a theologian's success. Kant, like Luther and like Leibniz, was an additional constraint on unsound German uprightness. A word against Kant as a moralist. A virtue must be our invention, our most personal self-defense and necessity. In every other sense it is merely a danger. What does not condition our life injures it. A virtue merely out of a sentiment of respect for the concept of virtue, as Kant would have it, is harmful. 
virtue, duty, the good in itself, the good with the character of impersonal and universal validity, these are phantoms in which the decline, the final debilitating of life, Kernigsbergian Chinadom, express themselves. The very reverse is commanded by the most fundamental laws of maintenance and growth, that everyone should devise his own virtue, his own categorical imperative for himself. A people perishes when it confuses its duty with the general concept of duty. Nothing ruins more profoundly or more intrinsically than every impersonal duty, every sacrifice before the Moloch of abstraction. I wonder that Kant's categorical imperative has not been seen as dangerous to life. The theologian instinct alone took it under protection. An action compelled by the instinct of life has in its pleasure the proof that it is a right action. And that nihilist, with Christian dogmatic intestines, understood pleasure as an objection. What destroys faster than to work, think, or feel without internal necessity, without a profoundly personal choice, without pleasure, as an automaton of duty? It is precisely the recipe for decadence, even for idiocy. Kant became an idiot. And that was the contemporary of Goethe. And this calamity of a cobweb spinner passed for the German philosopher still passes for it. I take care not to say what I think of the Germans. Has not Kant seen in the French Revolution the transition from the inorganic form of the state into the organic? Did he not ask himself if there was an event which could only be explained by a moral faculty in mankind, so that the tendency of mankind to goodness was proved by it once and for all? Kant's answer? That is revolution. The erring instinct in each and everything, anti-naturalness as instinct, German decadence as a philosophy. That is Kant. I exclude a few sceptics, the decent type in the history of philosophy. The remainder are ignorant of the first requirements of intellectual integrity. All of them behave just like little women, all those great enthusiasts and prodigies. They regard fine feelings as arguments, the heaving bosom as the bellows of divinity, conviction as a criterion of truth. In the end, Kant attempted, with German innocence, to give this form of corruption, this lack of intellectual conscience, a scientific colouring under the concept of practical reason. He devised a reason expressly for the occasions in which one does not need to trouble oneself about reason, namely when morality, when the sublime requirement thou shalt, becomes audible. If one considers that, among almost all nations, the philosopher is only the further development of the priestly type, this inheritance of the priest, the spurious, self-imposed coinage, no longer surprises one. When one has holy tasks, for example, to improve, to save, or to redeem men, when one carries divinity in one's breast, when one is the mouthpiece of other-world imperatives, with such a mission, one is already outside all merely reasonable valuations. One is already consecrated by such a task. It is already the type of a higher order. What does the priest care for science? He is above it. And the priest has ruled up until now. He has determined the concepts of true and untrue. Let us not underestimate this. We ourselves, we free spirits, are already a transvaluation of all values, an incarnate declaration of war against and triumph over all the old concepts of true and untrue. The most precious insights into things are the last to be discovered. The most precious insights, however, are the methods. All methods, all presuppositions of our present-day science have for millennia been held in the most profound contempt. By reason of them, a person was excluded from intercourse with honest men. He passed for an enemy of God, a despiser of truth, a possessed person. 
as a scientific man, a person was a chandra. We have had the entire pathos of mankind against us. Their concept of what truth ought to be, what the service of truth ought to be, every thou shalt, has hitherto been directed against us. Our objects, our practices, our quiet, prudent, mistrustful manner, all appeared to mankind as absolutely unworthy and contemptible. In the end, one might quite reasonably ask oneself if it was not really an aesthetic taste which kept mankind in blindness for so long. They wanted a picturesque effect from truth. In the same way, they wanted the knowledgeable ones to make a strong impression on their senses. Our modesty offended the taste of mankind the longest. Oh, how they understood that, these turkey cocks of 14. God! We have learned better. We have become more modest in everything. We no longer derive man from spirit, from Godhead. We have put him back among the animals. We regard him as the strongest animal, because he is the most cunning. His intellectuality is a consequence of this. We guard ourselves, on the other hand, against a conceit which would like to be heard here once more, just as if man had been the great secret purpose of zoological evolution. He is by no means a crown of creation. Every creature along with him is at an equal stage of perfection. And when we make that assertion, we still assert too much. Man is, taken relatively, the worst constituted animal, the most sickly, the most dangerously strayed from his instincts. To be sure, with all that, also the most interesting. As regards animals, Descartes was the first who, with a boldness worthy of reverence, ventured to think of the animal as a machine. Our entire physiology interests itself in the proof of this proposition. And, logically, we do not put man apart as Descartes did. Whatever till now has been understood with regard to man reaches to the precise extent that he has been understood mechanically. Formerly one gave man free will as his dowry out of a higher order. At present we have taken even will from him, in the sense that no faculty can any longer be understood under the term. The old word will serves only to designate a resultant, a kind of individual reaction which necessarily follows upon a number of partly contradictory, partly congruous stimuli. Will no longer works, it no longer moves. Formerly, one saw in man's consciousness, in his spirit, the proof of his higher origin, of his divinity. In order to perfect man, one advised him, after the manner of the tortoise, to withdraw the senses into himself, to cease having intercourse with the earthly, to shuffle off the mortal coil. Then the main part of him remained behind, pure spirit. We have also given better thought to this matter. The fact of becoming conscious, spirit, is regarded by us just as a symptom of the relative incompleteness of the organism, as an attempting, groping, mistaking, as a trouble by which much nervous energy is unnecessarily used up. We deny that anything whatsoever can be made perfect as long as it is still made conscious. Pure spirit is pure stupidity. When we deduct the nervous system and the senses, the mortal coil, our calculation is wrong. 15. That is all. In Christianity, neither morality nor religion is in contact with any point of actuality. Nothing but imaginary causes, God, soul, ego, spirit, free will, or even unfree will. Nothing but imaginary effects, sin, salvation, grace, punishment, forgiveness of sin. An intercourse between imaginary beings, God, spirits, souls, an imaginary science of nature, anthropocentric, absolute lack of the concept of natural causes, an imaginary psychology, nothing but self-misunderstandings, interpretations of pleasant or unpleasant general feelings, for example, the conditions of the nervous sympathicus, with the help of the sign language of religio-moral idiosyncrasy, 
repentance, remorse of conscience, temptation by the devil, presence of God, an imaginary teleology, the kingdom of God, the last judgment, everlasting life. This purely fictitious world is, greatly to its disadvantage, distinguished from the dream world, in that, while the latter reflects actuality, the former falsifies, depreciates, and negates it. Once the concept of nature had been devised as a concept antithetical to God, natural had to be the word for reprehensible. That whole fictitious world has its root in hatred against the natural, actuality. It is the expression of a profound dissatisfaction with the actual. But everything is explained by this. Who alone has reasons for lying himself out of actuality? He who suffers from it. But to suffer from actuality is to be an ill-constituted actuality. The preponderance of unpleasurable feelings over pleasurable feelings is the cause of that fictitious morality and religion. Such a preponderance, however, provides the formula 16. for decadence. A criticism of the Christian concept of God compels us to the same conclusion. A people which still believes in itself also still has its own God. In him it reverences the conditions by which it has prospered, its virtues. It projects its delight in itself, its feeling of power, into a being who can be thanked for them. He who is rich wishes to bestow. A proud people needs a god in order to sacrifice. Religion, within the limits of such presuppositions, is a form of gratitude. One is thankful for oneself. For that purpose one needs a god. Such a god must be able to be both serviceable and harmful. He must be able to be both friend and foe. He is admired in good and bad alike. The anti-natural castration of a god into a god of the merely good would be beyond the bounds of all desirability here. The bad god is as necessary as the good god, for one does not owe one's existence to tolerance and humanitarianism. What would a god be worth who did not know anger, revenge, jealousy, scorn, cunning, and violence? A god to whom perhaps not even the rapturous passions of triumph and destruction would be known. People would not understand such a god. Why should they have him? To be sure, when a people goes to ruin, when it feels its belief in the future and its hope of freedom finally vanish, when it becomes conscious of submission as the most profitable thing of all, and of the virtues of the submissive as conditions of maintenance, then its god is also obliged to change. He now becomes a sneak, timid and modest. He counsels peace of soul, an end of hatred, indulgence, love even towards friend and foe. He constantly moralizes. He creeps into the cave of every private virtue. He becomes everybody's god. He becomes a private man. He becomes a cosmopolitan. Formerly he represented a people, the strength of a people, all that was aggressive and thirsty for power in the soul of a people. Now he is merely the good God. In fact, there is no other alternative for gods. They are either the will to power, and so long as they are that, they will be national gods, or else the impotence to power, and then they necessarily become good. Wherever the will to power declines in any way, there is always also a physiological retrogression, a decadence. The deity of decadence, pruned of his manliest virtues and impulses, from now on becomes necessarily the god of the physiologically retrograde, the weak. They do not call themselves the weak, they call themselves the good. It is obvious, without a further hint being necessary, in what moments in history the dualistic fiction of a good and a bad god became possible. Through the same instinct by which the subjugated lower their god to the good in itself, they obliterate the good qualities out of the god of their conquerors. 
They take revenge on their masters by bedeviling their god. The good god, just like the devil, both are abortions of decadence. How can one still defer so much to the simplicity of Christian theologians as to decree with them that the continuous development of the concept of God from the God of Israel, from the national God to the Christian God, to the essence of everything good, is a progress. But even Renan does so, as if Renan had a right to simplicity. It is just the very opposite that strikes the eye. When the presuppositions of ascending life, when everything strong, brave, domineering, and proud have been eliminated out of the concept of God, when he sinks step by step to the symbol of a staff for the weary, a sheet anchor for all who are drowning, when he becomes the poor people's God, the sinner's God, the God of the sick par excellence, and when the predicate of Saviour, Redeemer, is left as the sole divine predicate, what does such a change speak of, such a reduction of the divine? To be sure, the kingdom of God has thereby become greater. Formerly, he had only his people, his chosen people. Since then, he has gone abroad on his travels, quite like his people itself. Since then, he has never again settled down quietly in any place, until he has finally become at home everywhere, the great cosmopolitan, till he has won over the great number, and the half of earth to his side. But the god of the great number, the democrat among gods, became nevertheless no proud pagan god. He remained a Jew. He remained the god of the nooks, the god of all dark corners and places, of all unhealthy quarters throughout the world. His world empire is still, as formerly, an underworld empire, a hospital, a subterranean empire, a ghetto empire. And he himself, so pale, so weak, so decadent, even the palest of the pale still became master over him. Monsieur the metaphysicians, the conceptual albinos. They spun their web around him so long that, hypnotized by their movements, he became a cobweb spinner, a metaphysician himself. From then on he spun the world again out of himself, subspecie Spinoza. From then on he transformed himself always into the thinner and the paler. He became ideal, he became pure spirit, he became absolute, he became thing in itself, ruin of a god. God became thing in itself. The Christian concept of God, God as God of the sick, God as cobweb spinner, God as spirit, is one of the most corrupt concepts of God ever arrived at on earth. It represents, perhaps, the gauge of low water in the descending development of the God type. God degenerated to the contradiction of life, instead of being its transfiguration and its eternal yes. In God, hostility is announced to life, to nature, to the will to life. God as the formula for every calumny of this world, for every lie of another world. In God, nothingness deified, the will to nothingness declared holy that the strong races of northern Europe have not thrust from themselves the Christian God is truly no honour to their religious talent, not to speak of their taste. They ought to have got the better of such a sickly and decrepit product of decadence. A curse lies upon them because they have not got the better of it. They have incorporated sickness, old age, and contradiction into all their instincts, they have created no god since. Almost two millennia, and not a single new god. But still continuing, and as if persisting by right, as an ultimatum and maximum of the god-shaping force of the Creator Spiritus in man, this pitiable god of Christian monotonotheism, this hybrid image of ruin, derived from nothingness, conceptualism and contradiction, 
in which all decadence instincts, all cowardliness and weariness of soul have their Thank sanction. You. With my condemnation of Christianity, I should not like to have done an injustice to a kindred religion, which even preponderates in the number of its followers, to Buddhism. The two are related as nihilistic religions. They are decadence religions. Both are separated from one another in the most remarkable manner. For the fact that they can now be compared, the critic of Christianity is profoundly grateful to the Indian scholars. Buddhism is a hundred times more realistic than Christianity. It has, in its nature, the heritage of an objective and cool propounding of questions. It arrives after a philosophical movement lasting hundreds of years. The concept of God is already done away with when it arrives. Buddhism is the only properly positivistic religion which history shows us, even in its theory of perception, a strict phenomenalism. It no longer speaks of a struggle against sin, but, quite doing justice to actuality, it speaks of a struggle against suffering. It has, and this distinguishes it profoundly from Christianity, the self-deception of moral concepts behind it. It stands, in my language, beyond good and evil. The two physiological facts on which it rests, and which it has in view, are, on the one hand, an excessive excitability of sensibility, which expresses itself as a refined capacity for pain, and, on the other hand, an over-intellectualizing, an over-long preoccupation with concepts and logical procedures, through which the personal instinct has received damage to the advantage of the impersonal. Both are conditions which at least some of my readers, the objective ones, will know, like myself, by experience. On the basis of these physiological conditions, a state of depression has originated, against which Buddha takes hygienic measures. He applies life in the open air as a measure against it, wandering life, moderation and selection in food, precaution against all intoxicants, similarly precautions against all emotions which create bile or heat the blood, no anxiety either for self or for others. He requires ideas which either give repose or gaiety. He devises means for disaccustoming oneself from others. He understands goodness, benignity, as health-promoting. Prayer is excluded, as is asceticism, no categorical imperative, no compulsion at all, not even within the monastic community a person can leave it. These would all be means to strengthen that excessive excitability. For that reason, too, he does not require a struggle against those who think differently. His doctrine resists nothing so much as the feeling of revenge, of aversion, of resentment. Hostility does not come to an end by hostility, the moving refrain of the whole of Buddhism. And rightly so. These very emotions would be extremely unhealthy in respect to the main dietetic purpose. The intellectual fatigue which he highlights, and which is expressed in an excessive objectivity, that is, weakening of individual interest, loss of weight, of egotism, he combats by strictly redirecting even the most intellectual interests back to the individual. In the doctrine of Buddha, Egotism became duty, the one thing needful, the how are you freed from suffering, regulated and determined the whole intellectual diet. One may perhaps call to mind that Athenian who likewise waged war against pure scientificality, Socrates, who elevated personal egotism to morality even in the domain of problems. The prerequisite for Buddhism is a very mild climate, great gentleness and liberality in customs, no militarism, and that it is the higher and learned classes in whom the movement has its focus. Cheerfulness, tranquility, and absence of desire are wanted as the highest goal, and the goal is attained. Buddhism is not a religion in which perfection is merely aspired after. The perfect is the normal case. In Christianity, 
the instincts of the subjugated and suppressed come into the foreground, it is the lowest classes who seek their goal here. Here, the casuistry of sin, self-criticism, and inquisition of conscience are practiced as occupations, as expedients against boredom. Here, the emotion towards a powerful one, called God, is constantly maintained by prayer. Here, the highest things are regarded as unattainable, as gifts, as grace. Here, also, public openness is lacking the hiding place, the dark chamber, are Christian. Here the body is despised, hygiene is repudiated as sensuality. The church even resists cleanliness. The first Christian regulation after the expulsion of the Moors was the closing of the public baths, of which Cordova alone possessed 270. A certain sense of cruelty towards self and others is Christian. The hatred against those thinking differently, the will to persecute. Gloomy and exciting concepts are in the foreground. The most greatly desired states, designated with the highest names, are epileptoid states. The diet is chosen so that it favors morbid phenomena and overexcites the nerves, the deadly hostility against the lords of the earth, the noble, and, at the same time, a concealed secret competition with them, one leaves them the body, one only wants the soul, are Christian. The hatred of intellect, of pride, courage, freedom, libertinage of intellect, is Christian. The hatred of the senses, of the delights of the senses, of all delight, is Christian. Christianity, when it left its first soil, the lowest classes, the underworld of the ancient world, when it went abroad among the barbarian nations in quest of power, had no longer to presuppose weary men, but internally savage, self-lacerating men, strong but ill-constituted men. The discontentedness of man with himself, the suffering from himself, is not here an excessive excitability and capacity for pain, as it is in the case of Buddhists, but on the contrary, it is an overpowerful longing for causing pain, for discharging the inner tension in hostile actions and concepts. Christianity had need of barbarous notions and values in order to become master of barbarians. Examples of such are the sacrifice of firstborns, the blood drinking at the communion, the contempt of intellect and of culture torture in all its forms, physical and non-physical, the great pomp of worship. Buddhism is a religion for late human beings, for kind, gentle races who have become over-intellectual and feel pain too readily. Europe is as yet far from being ripe for it. It leads them back to peace and cheerfulness, to an ordered diet in intellectual matters, to a certain hardening in physical matters, Christianity desires to become master of beasts of prey. Its expedient is to make them sick. Weakening is the Christian recipe for taming, for civilization. Buddhism is a religion for the end and the fatigue of civilization, which Christianity does not even find in existence, but which it may establish under certain conditions. Buddhism, to repeat once more, is a hundred times colder, sincerer, and more objective. It no longer needs to make its suffering, its capacity for pain, decent by the interpretation of sin. It simply says what it thinks, I suffer. For the barbarian, on the contrary, suffering in itself is no decent thing. He needs an explanation first, in order to confess to himself that he suffers. His instinct points him, rather, to the denial of suffering, to silent endurance. Here the word devil was a godsend. People had an overpowerful and terrible enemy. They did not need to be ashamed of suffering from such an enemy. Christianity has some refinements in its foundation which belong to the Orient, Above all, Christianity knows that it is quite indifferent as to whether anything is true, 
but it is of the highest importance to what extent it is believed to be true. Truth and the belief that something is true, two worlds with entirely exclusive interests, almost antithetical worlds, one arrives at each of them by fundamentally different paths. To be aware of this almost makes a wise man in the Orient. It is in this way that Brahmins understand it. It is in this way that Plato understands it. It is in this way that every scholar of esoteric wisdom understands it. When, for example, it is a happiness for a person to believe himself saved from sin, it is not necessary as a prerequisite that he is sinful, but only that he feels himself sinful. When, however, belief is necessary above everything else, reason, perception, and investigation must be discredited. The way to truth becomes a forbidden way. Strong hope is a far greater stimulus to life than any single actual occurring happiness. Sufferers must be maintained by a hope which cannot be contradicted by any actuality, which is not done away with by a fulfillment, an other-world hope. Precisely on account of this capacity to keep the unfortunate person in suspense, hope was regarded among the Greeks as the evil of evils, as the peculiarly insidious evil. It remained behind in the box of evil. In order that love may be possible, God must be a person. In order that the lowest instincts may have a voice, God must be young. It is necessary for the ardour of women to move a handsome saint into the foreground, for the ardour of men, a Mary. This is, of course, on the presupposition that Christianity desires to become master on a soil where the worship of Aphrodite or Adonis has already determined the concept of worship. The requirement of chastity strengthens the vehemence and inward intensity of religious instinct. It makes worship warmer, more enthusiastic, more soulful. Love is the state in which man sees things most widely different from what they are. Illusory power is there at its height, like sweetening and transfiguring power. One endures more in love than at other times. One puts up with everything. The problem was to devise a religion in which it was possible to love. With that, one is beyond the worst ills of life. One no longer sees them. So much for the three Christian virtues, faith, hope, and charity. I call them the three Christian shrewdnesses. Buddhism is too late, too positivistic, to still be shrewd in this manner. Four. I only touch here on the problem of the origin of Christianity. The first sentence for its solution is, Christianity can only be understood if one understands the soil out of which it has grown. It is not a counter-movement to Jewish instinct. It is, rather, the logical consequence of it, a further inference in its awe-inspiring logic. In the formula of the Redeemer, salvation is of the Jews. The second principle is, the psychological type of the Galilean is still recognizable, but only in its complete degeneration, which at the same time is mutilation and an overloading with foreign traits, could it serve the purpose for which it has been used, to be the type of a redeemer of mankind. The Jews are the most remarkable people in the history of the world, because when confronted with the question of being or not being, they preferred, with a perfectly weird consciousness, being at any price. This price was the radical falsifying of all nature, of all naturalness, of all actuality, of the entire inner world as well as the outer. They demarcated their position counter to all conditions under which a people could live previously, was permitted to live. They created out of themselves a concept antithetical to the natural conditions. They successively reversed, in an irreparable manner, religion, worship, morality, history, and psychology, into the contradiction of their natural values. 
we meet with the same phenomenon once more, and in unutterably magnified proportions, although only as a copy. The Christian Church, in comparison with the saintly people, dispenses with all pretensions to originality. The Jews, precisely on that account, are the most fateful nation in the history of the world. In their after-effect, they made mankind false to such an extent that the Christian can even today cherish an anti-Jewish feeling without comprehending that he is the ultimate consequence of Judaism. I have brought forward, psychologically for the first time, in my genealogy of morals, the antithetical concepts of a noble morality and a ressentiment morality, the latter originated out of a denial of the former. But this is Jewish-Christian morality, wholly and entirely. To be able to reject all that represents the ascending movement of life on earth, well-constitutedness, power, beauty, self-affirmation, the instinct of ressentiment, developed into genius, had to devise for itself another world here, from which the affirmation of life appeared as evil, as reprehensible in itself. Psychologically re-examined, the Jewish people is a people of the toughest vital force, placed under impossible conditions, voluntarily, out of a most profound policy of self-maintenance, it took the part of all decadence instincts, not as ruled by them, but because it divined in them a power by which to get along in opposition to the world. They are the counterpart of all decadence. They were compelled to exhibit them to the point of illusion. They have, with a non-plus-ultra of theatrical genius, known how to place themselves at the head of all decadence movements, as in the Christianity of Paul, and have created something out of them which is stronger than any party affirmative of life. Decadence for the class of men who aspired to power in Judaism and Christianity, a priestly class, is only a means. This class of men has a vital interest in making mankind sick, and in reversing the concepts good and bad, true and false, into a mortally dangerous and world-calumniating sense. The history of Israel is invaluable as a typical history of the denaturalizing of natural values. I shall indicate five matters of fact in this process. Originally, and above all in the time of the kingdom, Israel, like other people, stood in the right relation— that is, in the natural relation to all things. Their Yahweh was the expression of consciousness of power, the delight in themselves, the hope of themselves. In him they expected victory and prosperity. With him they had confidence in nature, that it would provide what they needed, above all rain. Yahweh is the God of Israel, and consequently the God of justice, the logic of every people that is in power and has a good conscience about it. In festival worship, both these sides of a people's self-affirmation are expressed. It is thankful for the great destinies by which it came to the fore. It is thankful in relation to the course of the year, and all the good fortune in cattle-rearing and agriculture. This state of things continued to be the ideal for a long time, even when, in a sad manner, it was done away with, anarchy from within and the Assyrian from without. But the people firmly retained, as their highest desirability, the vision of a king who was a good soldier and a strict judge. Above all, that typical prophet, that is, critic and satirist of the hour, Isaiah. But every hope remained unrealized. The old god could no longer do what he formerly could. They might have to let him go. What happened? They changed his concept. They denaturalized his concept. They retained him at that price. Yahweh, the God of justice, no longer a unity with Israel, an expression of national pride, only a God under conditions. The concept of God becomes an instrument in the hands of priestly agitators, who from then on interpret all good fortune as reward, all misfortune as punishment for disobedience to God, for sin. 
that most falsified manner of interpretation of a pretended moral order of the world, with which once and for all the natural concepts of cause and effect are turned upside down. As soon as natural causality, by means of reward and punishment, has been done away with, an anti-natural causality is needed. All the remaining unnaturalness then follows. A god who demands, in place of a god who helps, who surmounts difficulties, who is, after all, the word for every happy inspiration of courage and self-confidence, morality, no longer the expression of the conditions of the life and growth of a people, no longer its fundamental instinct of life, but become abstract, the antithesis of life. Morality as a fundamental debasement of the imagination, as evil eye for everything. What is Jewish, what is Christian morality? Chance robbed of its innocence, misfortune dirtied by the concept of sin, well-being as danger, as temptation, bad physiological condition poisoned by the serpent of conscience. The concept of God falsified, the concept of morality falsified. The Jewish priesthood did not stop there. They could make no use of the whole history of Israel away with it. These priests brought about that miracle of falsification, the document of which lies before us in a good part of the Bible. With an unequalled scorn of every tradition, of every historical reality, they translated the past of their own people into the religious. That is, they made a stupid salvation out of it, a mechanism of offence against Yahweh and punishment, of piety towards Yahweh and reward. We should feel this most disgraceful act of historical falsification much more painfully if the ecclesiastical interpretation of the history of millennia had not almost blunted us to the requirement of integrity in historicis. And the philosophers seconded the Church. The lie of a moral order of the world goes through the whole development even of modern philosophy. What does a moral order of the world signify? That there is, once for all, a will of God, as to what men have to do and what they have not to do, that the value of a people or of an individual is determined by how much or how little the will of God is obeyed, that in the destinies of a people or of an individual the will of God is demonstrated as ruling that is, as punishing and rewarding in proportion to obedience. The reality in place of this pitiable lie is that a parasitic species of man, the priests, who only flourish at the cost of all healthy forms of life, misuse the name of God. They call a state of society, in which the priest determines the value of things, the kingdom of God. They call the means by which such a state is attained or maintained the will of God. With a cold-blooded cynicism, they assess peoples, ages, and individuals according to whether they were serviceable to the priestly ascendancy or resisted it. Let us see them at work. Under the hands of Jewish priests, the great period in the history of Israel became a period of decay. The exile, the long misfortune, was transformed into an eternal punishment for the great period, a period in which, as yet, the priest was nothing. According to their requirements, they made miserable sneaking creatures and hypocrites or ungodly persons out of the powerful and very freely constituted characters in the history of Israel. They simplified the psychology of every great event into the idiotic formula obedience or disobedience to God. A step further, the will of God, that is, the conditions of maintenance for the power of the priest, must be known. For this purpose a revelation is needed, that is, a great literary forgery becomes necessary, a holy book is discovered, it is made public with all hieratic pomp, with fast days and cries of lamentation for the long sin. The will of God was fixed long before, 
The whole evil lay in the fact that people had estranged themselves from the holy book. Moses was already the revealed will of God. What had happened? The priest, with severity and with pedantry, had once and for all formulated what he wanted to have. What is the will of God? Even to the great and the small imposts which had to be paid to him, not forgetting the most savoury pieces of meat, for the priest is a beefsteak eater. From now on all the affairs of life are regulated in such a way that the priest is indispensable everywhere. At all natural events of life, at birth, at marriage, in sickness, at death, not to speak of the sacrifice, the mealtime, the holy parasite appears in order to denaturalize them, in his language, to sanctify them. For that must be understood. Every natural custom, every natural institution, the state, the administration of justice, marriage, the care of the sick and the poor, every requirement prompted by the instinct of life, everything, in short, that has its value in itself, is, as a principle, made worthless, inimical to any value, through the parasitism of the priest, or of a moral order of the world. It has need of a supplementary sanction, a value-bestowing power is necessary, which denies naturalness in these things, and only by doing so creates value. The priest depreciates, desecrates naturalness. It is only at this cost that he exists at all. Disobedience to God, that is, to the priest, to law, now gets the name of sin. The means for a person reconciling himself again to God are, as is only to be expected, means by which the subjugation under the priest is only more thoroughly guaranteed. The priest alone saves. Re-examined psychologically, sins are indispensable in every society organized by priests. They are the real levers of power. The priest lives by the sins. It is needful for him that there should be sinning. Principal proposition, God forgives him who does penance, that is, him who submits himself to 27. the priest. On a soil falsified in this way, where all naturalness, every natural value, all reality, had the profoundest instincts of the ruling class opposed to it, Christianity grew up, a form of mortal hostility to reality, which has not as yet been surpassed. The holy people, who had maintained only priestly values, only priestly words, for all matters, and who, with the consistency which may inspire awe, had separated themselves from everything else of power that existed on earth, as from the unholy, the world, sin, this people produced for its instinct a final formula which was logical to the point of self-negation. As Christianity, it negated even the last form of reality, the holy people, the chosen people, Jewish reality itself. The case is of the first rank. The small, seditious movement, which is christened by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, is the Jewish instinct once more, expressed in other terms, the priestly instinct, which no longer endures the priest as a reality, the invention of a yet more abstract form of existence, a yet more unreal vision of the world, than is determined by the organization of a church. Christianity negates the church. I fail to see what the uprising was directed against, as the originator of which Jesus has been understood or misunderstood, if it was not an uprising against the Jewish church, the word church taken precisely in the sense in which we take it at present. It was an uprising against the good and just, against the saints of Israel, against the hierarchy of society, not against its corruption, but against caste, privilege, order, formula. It was the unbelief in higher men, the denial of all that was priest and theologian. But the hierarchy which was thereby, though only for an instant called into question, was the pile work on which the Jewish people alone continued in the midst of the waters, the laboriously acquired last possibility of remaining in being, 
the residuum of its detached political existence. An attack upon this was an attack upon the profoundest national instinct, upon the toughest national will to life which has ever existed on earth. This holy anarchist, who incited the lowest classes, the outcasts and sinners, the chandlers within Judaism, to opposition against the ruling order, with language which, if the Gospels can be trusted, would even at the present day send a person to Siberia, was a political criminal, so far as political criminals were possible in an absurdly unpolitical community. This brought him to the cross. The proof of it is the inscription on the cross. He died for his guilt. All ground is lacking for the assertion, however often it has been made, that he died for the guilt of others. It is quite another question whether he was at all conscious of a contrast of that kind, whether he was not merely felt to be such a contrast. And it is only here that I touch on the problem of the psychology of the Saviour. I confess that I read few books which present such difficulties as the Gospels, these difficulties are different from those in which the learned curiosity of German intellect has celebrated one of its most memorable triumphs by pointing out. The time is far distant when I, with the wise dullness of a refined philologist, like every young scholar, thoroughly tasted the work of the incomparable Strauss. I was then twenty years of age. I am now too serious for that. Of what account are the contradictions of tradition to me? How can legends of saints be called tradition at all? The stories of saints are the most ambiguous literature that exists. To apply scientific methods to it when no other documents have reached us appears to me condemned in principle, mere learned idling. What is of account to me is the psychological type of the Saviour. For it might be contained in the Gospels, in spite of the Gospels, however much it might be mutilated or overloaded with strange features, just as that of Francis of Assisi is contained in his legends, in spite of the legends. Not the truth with regard to what he did or said, or how he died exactly, but the question whether his type is at all conceivable now, whether it is handed down to us. The attempts with which I am acquainted to pick out of the Gospels even the history of a soul seem to me to be proofs of a detestable psychological frivolity. Monsieur Renan, a buffoon in psychologists, got the two most inappropriate concepts imaginable into his explanation of the type of Jesus, the concept of genius and the concept of hero. But if anything is unevangelical, it is the concept of hero precisely the antithesis of all contending, of all feeling oneself in struggle, has here become instinct. The capacity for resistance here becomes morality. Resist not evil, the profoundest saying of the Gospels, in a certain sense, the key to them. Blessedness in peace, in gentleness, in inability to be hostile. What is glad tidings? True life, eternal life, has been found. It is not promised, it is there, it is in you. As life in love, in love without abatement and exclusion, without distance. Everyone is the child of God. Jesus does not at all claim anything for himself alone. As a child of God, everyone is equal to everyone else. To make a hero out of Jesus. And to think what a misunderstanding is the word genius. Our whole concept of intellect, our cultured concept of it, has no meaning at all in the world in which Jesus lived. If one spoke with the rigidity of the physiologist, quite another word would be the thing here. We recognize a condition of morbid excitability, of the sense of touch in which the latter shrinks back in horror from every contact, from every seizing of a firm object. Let such a physiological habitus be translated into its ultimate logic as an instinctive hatred against every reality, as a flight into the unintelligible, into the incomprehensible, as an aversion from every formula, every concept of time and space, 
against all that is firmly established, custom, institution, church, as feeling at home in a world with which no mode of reality is any longer in touch, in a merely inner world, a true world, an eternal world. The kingdom of God is within you. The instinctive hatred of reality. Consequence of an extreme liability to suffering and excitement, which no longer wants to be touched at all, because it feels all contact too profoundly. The instinctive exclusion of all antipathy, of all hostility, of all sentiment of limits and distances. Consequence of an extreme liability to suffering and excitement, which feels every resistance on its own part, every necessity for resistance, as an intolerable displeasure, that is, as injurious, as dissuaded by the instinct of self-preservation, and which knows blessedness, delight, only in no longer offering opposition, to any one either to the ill or to the evil, love as the soul, as the final possibility of life. These are the two physiological realities upon which, out of which, the salvation doctrine has grown. I call them a sublime, extended development of hedonism, on a thoroughly morbid basis. Although with a large addition of Greek vitality and nerve force, Epicureanism, the salvation doctrine of paganism, remains most closely related to it. Epicurus, a typical decadent, first recognized by me as such. The fear of pain, even of the infinitely small in pain, it cannot end otherwise than as a religion of love. I have given beforehand my answer to the problem. The prerequisite for it is that the type of the Saviour is only preserved to us in a strong distortion. This distortion has in itself much probability. Such a type could not, for several reasons, remain pure, whole, or free from additions. The milieu in which this strange character moved must have made its mark upon it, just as the history, the fate of the first Christian community must have done. By that fate, the type was retrospectively enriched with traits which only become comprehensible by warfare and by the purposes of propaganda by that strange and sickly world into which we are introduced by the Gospels, a world like that of a Russian novel, in which the outcasts of society, nervous affections and childish idiocy, seem to make a rendezvous. The type must, under all circumstances, have been rendered coarser. The first disciples especially had to translate a being swimming entirely in symbols and incomprehensibilities into their own crudity, in order to understand anything of it at all. For them, the type only existed after having been moulded into better-known forms. The prophet, the messiah, the future judge, the moral teacher, the miracle worker, John the Baptist— just so many opportunities for mistaking the type. Finally, let us not undervalue the proprium of all great veneration, especially sectarian veneration. It extinguishes the original and often painfully alien characteristics and idiosyncrasies in the venerated being. It does not see them itself. One has to regret that Dostoevsky has not lived in the neighborhood of this most interesting decadent. I mean, someone who knew just how to perceive the thrilling charm of such a mixture of the sublime, the sickly, and the childish. A last point of view. The type, as a decadent type, could actually have been of a peculiar plurality and contradictoriness. Such a possibility is not completely to be excluded. Nevertheless, everything goes against this. Tradition, above all, would have to be remarkably true and objective in this case, of which we have reasons for supposing the contrary. In the meanwhile, there yawns a contradiction between the mountain, lake, and meadow preacher, whose appearance impresses one like that of a Buddha on a soil very unlike that of India, and the fanatical aggressor, the deadly enemy of theologians and priests, whom Renan's malice has glorified as le grand maître en ironie.
I myself do not doubt that the profuse amount of gall, and even of esprit, has only overflowed upon the type of the master out of the excited condition of Christian propaganda. One knows well the keenness of all sectarians to shape their master into an apology of themselves. When the first community had need of a censuring, wrangling, wrathful, maliciously subtle theologian in opposition to theologians, they created their god according to their need, as they also, without hesitation, put into his mouth those completely unevangelical concepts which they could not then do without, the second coming, the last judgment, every kind of temporal expectation and 32. promise. I resist, let it be said once more, introducing the fanatic into the type of the Saviour. The very word imperieur, which Renan used, annulled the type. The good tidings are just that there are no more antitheses. The kingdom of heaven belongs to children. The faith whose voice is heard here is not a faith acquired by struggle. It is there, it is from the beginning, it is, as it were, a childishness which has flowed back into the intellectual. The case of retarded puberty, undeveloped in the organism, as a phenomenon resulting from degeneration, is at least familiar to physiologists. Such a belief is not angry, it does not find fault, it does not offer resistance, it does not bring the sword. It has no idea in what respect it might some day separate people. It does not prove itself either by miracles or by reward and promise, or even by the Scripture. It is every moment its own miracle, its own reward, its own proof, its own kingdom of God. Neither does this belief formulate itself. It lives, it resists formulas. To be sure, the accident of environment, of language, of schooling— determines a certain circle of concepts. Primitive Christianity uses only Judeo-Semitic concepts. The eating and drinking at the communion belong here, those concepts so badly misused by the Church, like everything Jewish. But let us be careful not to see in this anything more than a symbolic speech, a semiotic, an opportunity for similes. It is precisely the preliminary condition of this anti-realist being able to speak at all that not a single word is taken literally. Among the Indians he would have made use of the Sankyam concepts, among the Chinese he would have made use of those of Lao Tse, and would not have felt the difference. One might, with some tolerance of expression, call Jesus a free spirit. He does not care a bit for anything fixed. The word killeth, all that is fixed, killeth. The concept, the experience of life, as he alone knows it, is for him opposed to every kind of expression, formula, law, belief, or dogma. He speaks merely of the inmost things. Life, or truth, or light are his expressions for the inmost things. Everything else, the whole of reality, the whole of nature, language itself, has for him merely the value of a sign or a simile. Here one must take care not to mistake anything, however great the seduction may be which lies in Christian, that is, in ecclesiastical prejudice. Such a symbolism par excellence stands outside of all religion, all concepts of worship, all history, all natural science, all experience of the world, all knowledge, all politics, all psychology, all books, all art. The knowledge of Jesus is just the pure folly that there should be anything of that kind. Civilization is not even known to him by hearsay. He has no need of any struggle against it. He does not negate it. The same is true of the state of the whole civil order and society, of labor, of war. He has never had any reason to negate the world. He has never had any idea of the ecclesiastical concept of the world. Negation is precisely what is quite impossible for him. Dialectics are similarly lacking. The notion is lacking that a belief, a truth, could be proved by reasons. 
His proofs are internal lights, internal feelings of delight and self-affirmations, nothing but proofs of force. Such a doctrine is not even able to contradict. It does not even conceive that there are other doctrines, that there can be other doctrines. It does not even know how to represent an opposite mode of thinking to itself. Where such is met with, the former will mourn concerning blindness from heartfelt sympathy, for it sees the light, but it will make no objection. In the entire psychology of the gospel, the concepts of guilt and punishment are lacking, similarly the concept of reward. Sin, every relationship of distance between God and man, is done away with. It is precisely that which is the glad tidings. Blessedness is not promised, it does not depend on conditions, it is the sole reality, the rest is symbolism for speaking of it. The consequence of such a condition projects itself into a new practice, the truly evangelical practice. It is not a belief which distinguishes the Christian. The Christian acts, he distinguishes himself, by another mode of acting. In that mode, he does not offer resistance, either by word or in heart, to those acting in a hostile way towards him. In that mode, he makes no distinction between foreigners and natives, between Jews and non-Jews. The neighbor is, properly, the fellow-believer, the Jew. In that mode, he does not get angry at anyone, does not despise anyone. In that mode, he neither lets himself be seen in the law courts, nor takes their claims into account, not swearing. In that mode, under no circumstances, does he separate from his wife, not even in the case of her proved unfaithfulness. All fundamentally one proposition, all the consequences of one instinct. The life of the Saviour was nothing else but this practice. Neither was his death anything else. He had no need of any formulas or rites for intercourse with God, not even of prayer. He has settled accounts with the whole of the Jewish penance and reconciliation doctrine. He knows that it is by the practice of life alone that one feels himself divine, blessed, evangelical, at all times a child of God. Neither penitence nor prayer for forgiveness is a way to God. Evangelical practice alone leads to God, is itself God. What was abolished by the gospel was the Judaism of the concepts of sin, forgiveness of sin, faith, salvation by faith. The entire Jewish ecclesiastical doctrine was negated in the glad tidings. The profound instinct for the problem of how to live in order to feel oneself in heaven, to feel oneself eternal, while in every other condition one feels that one is not in the least in heaven, this alone is the psychological reality of salvation, a new mode of conduct, not a new faith. If I understand anything of this great symbolist, it is that he only took inner realities as realities, as truths, that he only understood the rest, all that is natural, temporal, spatial, historical, as signs, as occasion for similes. The concept of the Son of Man is not a concrete person belonging to history, some individual, solitary case, but an eternal fact, a psychological symbol freed from the concept of time. The same is again true, and true in the highest sense, of the God of this typical symbolist, of the kingdom of God, of the kingdom of heaven, the sonship of God. Nothing is more unchristian than the ecclesiastical crudities of a God as a person, of a kingdom of God which comes, of a kingdom of heaven in another world, of a Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. All that is, forgive me the expression, the fist in the eye, oh, in what an eye, of the gospel. Historical cynicism in the mockery of the symbol. But it is quite palpable what is alluded to by the figures of father and son, not palpable for everyone, I admit, 
By the word sun, the entrance into the collective sentiment of transfiguration of all things, blessedness, is expressed. By the word father, this sentiment itself, the sentiment of eternity and completeness. I am ashamed to recall what the Church has made out of this symbolism. Has it not placed an amphitryon story at the threshold of Christian faith, and a dogma of immaculate conception over and above? But it has thereby maculated conception. The kingdom of heaven is a state of the heart, not something which comes over the earth or after death. The entire concept of natural death is lacking in the gospel. Death is no bridge, no transition. This concept is lacking because it belongs to an entirely different world, which is merely apparent, merely useful to serve for symbolism. The hour of death is not a Christian concept. The hour, time, physical life, and its crises do not exist at all for the teacher of the glad tidings. The kingdom of God is not something which is expected. It has no yesterday and no day after tomorrow. It does not come in a thousand years. It is an experience in a heart. It is present everywhere. It is present nowhere. This bringer of glad tidings died as he lived, as he taught, not to save men, but to show how one ought to live. It is the practice which he left behind to mankind, his behavior before the judges, before the guards, before his accusers, and in the presence of every kind of calumny and mockery, his behavior on the cross. He does not resist, he does not defend his right, he takes no step to avert from himself the most extreme consequences. What is more, he exacts them, and he entreats, he suffers, he loves with those in those who do him wrong. Not to defend himself, not to be angry, not to make answerable, but not even to resist an evil one, to love him. Only we, we emancipated spirits, have the prerequisite for understanding a thing which has been misunderstood by nineteen centuries. That integrity which has become instinctive and passionate, which makes war against the holy lie even more than against any other. People were unspeakably far from our affectionate and prudent neutrality, from that discipline of intellect which alone makes it possible to search out such unfamiliar and delicate affairs. With an insolent selfishness, they always sought only their own advantage in these things. They erected the church out of the antithesis to the gospel. He who sought for signs that an ironical divinity operated behind the great drama of the world would find no small support in the stupendous question mark called Christianity. That mankind should bow the knee before the antithesis of that which was the origin, the meaning, and the right of the gospel that they should have declared wholly precisely those features in the concept of church which the bringer of glad tidings regarded as beneath him, as behind him, one would seek in vain for a grander form of grand historical irony. 47. Our age is proud of its historical sense. How has it been able to make itself believe in the absurdity that the crude miracle-worker and redeemer fable stands at the commencement of Christianity, and that everything spiritual and symbolic is only a later development? Reversely, the history of Christianity, and, of course, from the death on the cross onwards, is the history of the gradually cruder and cruder misunderstanding of an original symbolism. With every extension of Christianity over still broader, still ruder masses, in whom the prerequisites out of which it was born were more and more lacking, it became more necessary to vulgarize, to barbarize Christianity. It has taken into itself doctrines and rites from all the subterranean cults of the Imperium Romanum, and the absurdity of all kinds of morbid reason. The fate of Christianity lay in the necessity that its faith itself 
had to become as morbid, as low, and vulgar, as the needs were morbid, low, and vulgar, which had to be gratified by it. As the church, the morbid barbarism itself, finally swells up into power, the church, that form of deadly hostility to all integrity, to all elevation of soul, to all discipline of intellect, to all ingenious and gracious humanity, the Christian, the noble values. It is only we, we emancipated spirits, who have re-established this greatest of all antitheses of values. I do not suppress a sigh at this point. There are days when I am visited by a feeling, blacker than the blackest melancholy, contempt of man. And that I may leave no doubt with regard to what I despise, whom I despise. It is the man of today, the man with whom I am fatally contemporaneous, the man of today. I suffocate from his impure breath. With respect to what is past, I am, like all men of knowledge, of a great tolerance, that is, a generous self-control. With a gloomy circumspection, I go through the madhouse world of entire millennia. It may be called Christianity, Christian faith, Christian church. I take care not to make mankind accountable for its insanities. But my feeling changes suddenly— and bursts out as soon as I enter the modern period, our period, our age knows. What was formerly merely morbid now has become unseemly. It is now unseemly to be a Christian, and here my loathing commences. I look around me. There is no longer a word left of what was formerly called truth. We no longer endure it when a priest even takes the word truth into his mouth. Even with the most modest pretensions to integrity, it must be known at present that a theologian, a priest, a pope, not only errs but lies with every sentence he speaks, that he is no longer at liberty to lie out of innocence, out of ignorance. Even the priest knows as well as anyone knows that there is no longer any God, any sinner, any saviour, that free will and a moral order of the world are lies. Seriousness, the profound self-overcoming of intellect, no longer allows anyone to be ignorant of these matters. All concepts of the Church have been recognised for what they are, as the wickedest of all forms of false coinage invented for the purpose of depreciating nature, natural values. The priest himself has been recognised for what he is, as the most dangerous species of parasite, as the actual poison spider of life. We know, our conscience knows today, what those sinister inventions of the priests and of the church are really worth, what purpose was served by those inventions by which that state of self-prostitution of mankind has been reached, whose aspect can excite loathing. The concepts, the other world, last judgment, immortality of soul, soul itself, they are torture instruments. They are systems of cruelty by virtue of which the priest became master, remained master. Everybody knows that. And nevertheless, everything remains in the old way. What happened to the last sentiment of seemliness, of respect for ourselves, when even our statesmen, otherwise a very unbiased species of men, and practical anti-Christians through and through, call themselves Christians at the present day? and go to communion. A prince at the head of his regiments, splendid as the expression of the selfishness and elation of his nation, but without any shame, confessing himself a Christian. Whom, then, does Christianity deny? What does it call the world? To be a soldier, a judge, a patriot, to defend oneself, to guard one's honour, to seek one's advantage, to be proud— all practice of every hour, all instincts, all valuations resulting in deeds, are at present anti-Christian. What a monster of falsity must modern man be, that he nevertheless 
is not ashamed to still be called a Christian. To resume, I shall now repeat the genuine history of Christianity. The very word Christianity is a misunderstanding. In reality, there has been only one Christian, and he died on the cross. The Evangel died on the cross. What was called Evangel, from that hour onwards, was already the antithesis of what he had lived. Bad tidings, a disangel. It is false to the verge of absurdity to see in a belief, perhaps in the belief of salvation through Christ, the distinguishing mark of the Christian. Christian practice alone, a life such as he who died on the cross lived, is Christian. At present, such a life is still possible, for certain men it is even necessary. Genuine, original Christianity will be possible at all times. Not a believing, but a doing, a not doing of many things, above all a different existence. For states of consciousness, or any kind of believing, a taking for granted, for example, as every psychologist knows, are quite indifferent, and of the fifth rank in comparison with the value of instincts, more strictly expressed, the whole concept of intellectual causality is false. To reduce being a Christian, Christianness, to a taking for granted, to a mere phenomenality of consciousness, is to negate Christianness. In fact, there have never been Christians at all. The Christian, or what for two millennia has been called a Christian, is merely a psychological self-misunderstanding. Looked at more closely, it was merely the instincts which dominated in the Christian in spite of all his belief. And what kind of instincts? Belief has been at all times, for example with Luther, only a cloak, a pretense, a curtain behind which the instincts played their game, a shrewd blindness with regard to the dominance of certain instincts. Belief, I have already called it the peculiar Christian shrewdness, People always spoke about their belief, but always acted merely from their instincts. Nothing is contained in the Christian world of concepts which is in touch with actuality. On the other hand, we recognized in the instinctive hatred of all actuality the motivating element, the only motivating element at the root of Christianity. What follows from this? That here, in Psychologists also, the error is radical. It is essence determining. It is substance. A concept taken away here, a single reality put in its place, and the whole of Christianity tumbles into nothingness. Looked at from a high standpoint, this strangest of all facts, a religion not only determined by errors, but by inventive and even ingenious, only in harmful, only in life-poisoning and heart-poisoning errors, is a spectacle for the gods. For those deities who are at the same time philosophers, and with whom I have met, for example, at those celebrated dialogues on Naxos. In the hour when the loathing leaves them and us, they become thankful for the spectacle of the Christian. The miserable small star called Earth deserves perhaps a divine glance, divine sympathy alone on account of this curious case. Do not let us undervalue the Christian. The Christian, false even to innocence, is far beyond the ape. With respect to the Christian, a well-known theory of dissent becomes a mere 40. compliment. The fate of the gospel was decided with the death. It hung on the cross. It was only the death, the unexpected, disgraceful death. It was only the cross, which in general was reserved for the canai alone. It was only this most awful paradox that brought the disciples face to face with the real enigma. Who was that? What was that? The feeling staggered and profoundly insulted, the suspicion that such a death might be the refutation of their cause, the frightful question mark, why has this happened? This condition is understood only too well. 
Here everything had to be necessary. Everything had to have significance, reason, highest reason. The love of a disciple knows nothing of chance. It was only now that the chasm opened up. Who killed him? Who was his natural enemy? This question came like a flash of lightning. Answer, domineering Judaism, its upper class. From that moment, they felt themselves in revolt against the established order. They afterwards understood Jesus as in revolt against the established order. Till then, this combative characteristic, denying by word and deed, had been absent from his likeness. Even more, he had been the antithesis of it. Evidently, the little community did not precisely understand the main thing, in what respect an example was set by dying in this manner, the freedom, the superiority over every feeling of ressentiment, a sign of how little they understood of him at all. In itself, Jesus could not wish anything by his death, but publicly to give the strongest test, the demonstration of his doctrine. But his disciples were far from forgiving this death, which would have been evangelical in the highest sense, and were equally far from offering themselves to a similar death in gentle and charming peace of heart. Precisely the most unevangelical of feelings, revenge, again came to the fore. It was deemed impossible that the affair could be at an end with this death. Recompense, judgment was needed. And yet what can be more unevangelical than recompense, punishment, and sitting in judgment? The popular expectation of a Messiah came once more into the foreground. An historical moment came into view. The kingdom of God comes for the judgment of his enemies. But with this, everything is misunderstood. The kingdom of God as a concluding act, as a promise. For the gospel had been precisely the existence, the fulfillment, the actuality of that kingdom. Such a death was just precisely that kingdom of God. It was only now that the whole of the contempt of and bitterness against the Pharisees and theologians was introduced into the type of the master. By this, he was made a Pharisee and a theologian. On the other hand, the enraged reverence of these entirely disjointed souls could no longer endure the evangelical equal entitlement of everybody to be a child of God, which Jesus had taught. Their revenge was to elevate Jesus in an extravagant fashion, to sever him from themselves just in the same way as the Jews had formerly separated their God from themselves and raised him aloft in revenge on their enemies. The one God and the one Son of God, both products of ressentiment. And now an absurd problem came to the surface. How could God permit that? With respect to this, the deranged reason of the little community found quite a frightfully absurd answer. God gave his Son for the forgiveness of sins as a sacrifice. All at once it was at an end with the gospel, the sacrifice for guilt, and precisely in its most repugnant and barbarous form, the sacrifice of the innocent for the sins of the guilty. What a horrifying paganism! For Jesus had done away with the concept of guilt itself. He denied that there was any gulf between man and God. He lived this unity of God and man as his glad tidings, and not as a privilege. From that time onwards, the type of the Saviour is infiltrated progressively by the doctrine of judgment and of the second coming, by the doctrine of death as a sacrificial death, and by the doctrine of resurrection, with which the whole concept of blessedness, the entire and sole reality of the gospel, is pilfered away in favour of a state after death. Paul, with the rabbinical impudence which distinguishes him in every respect, has brought reason into this concept, this indecency of a concept, in the following way. 
If Christ has not been raised from the dead, your faith is in vain. And all at once there arose out of the gospel the most contemptible of all unfulfillable promises, the shameless doctrine of personal immortality. Yet Paul himself taught it as a reward. One sees what came to an end with the death on the cross, a new, a thoroughly original commencement of a Buddhistic peace movement, of an actual and not merely promised happiness on earth. For this remains, I emphasized it before, the fundamental distinction between the two decadence religions. Buddhism gives no promise, but keeps every one. Christianity gives every promise, but keeps none. The glad tidings were followed closely by the worst of all, those of Paul. In Paul, the antithetical type of the bearer of glad tidings is personified. The genius in hatred, in the vision of hatred, in the relentless logic of hatred. Everything has been sacrificed to hatred by this disangelist. Above all, the Saviour. Paul nailed the Saviour to his own cross. The life, the example, the teaching, the death, the significance, and the law of the entire gospel, nothing more was left when this false coiner conceived by hatred what he alone could use. Not reality, not historical truth. And once more the priestly instinct of the Jew perpetrated the same great crime against history. It simply rubbed out the yesterday, the day before yesterday, of Christianity. It invented for itself a history of first Christianity. Yet more, it falsified the history of Israel over again, in order to make it appear as a history preliminary to its achievement. All prophets are now supposed to have spoken of its Saviour. The Church later even falsified the history of mankind into a history preliminary to Christianity. The type of the Saviour, his teaching, his practice, his death, the significance of his death, even the sequel to his death, nothing remained untouched, nothing resembled the facts. Paul simply shifted the centre of gravity of that whole existence behind this existence into the lie of risen Jesus. In truth, he could not use the life of the Saviour at all. He needed the death on the cross, and something more besides. To take as honest a Paul, who had his home at the principal seat of Stoic enlightenment, when he derives the proof that the Saviour is yet living from a hallucination, or even to give credence to his account that he had had such a hallucination, would be a genuine foolishness on the part of a psychologist. Paul willed the end, consequently he willed also the means. What he himself did not believe was believed by the idiots among whom he cast his teaching. His requirement was power. With Paul, the priest sought once more for power. He could use only those concepts, doctrines, symbols, with which one tyrannizes over masses and forms herds. What was the only thing that Muhammad later borrowed from Christianity? The invention of Paul, his expedient for priestly tyranny, for forming herds, the belief in immortality, that is, the doctrine of judgment. When the center of gravity of life is placed not in life, but in the other world, in nothingness, Life has in reality been deprived of its center of gravity. The great lie of personal immortality destroys all reason, all naturalness of instinct. All that is generous, that is life-furthering, that pledges for the future in instincts, henceforth excites mistrust. So to live that, there is no longer any significance to live. That now becomes the significance of life. For what purpose social sentiment? For what purpose to still be grateful for ancestry and for forefathers? For what purpose to cooperate, to trust, to further, and have in view any general welfare? So many temptations, so many deviations from the right path. 
one thing is needful, that everyone, as an immortal soul, has equal rank with everyone else, that in the universality of beings the salvation of every individual can lay claim to eternal importance, that little hypocrites and half-crazed people dare to imagine that on their account the laws of nature are constantly broken, such an enhancement of every kind of selfishness to infinity, to impudence, cannot be branded with sufficient contempt. And yet Christianity owes its triumph to this pitiable flattery of personal vanity. In this way it has enticed over to its side all the ill-constituted, the seditiously disposed, the underprivileged, the whole scum and dross of humanity. Salvation of the soul means, in plain words, the world revolves around me. The poison of the teaching of equal rights for all has been spread abroad by Christianity more than by anything else as a matter of principle. Christianity has, from the most secret recesses of bad instincts, waged a deadly war against every sentiment of reverence and distance between man and man, that is, against the prerequisite to every elevation, to every growth of civilization. Out of the ressentiment of the masses it has forged for itself its principal weapon against us, against all that is noble, glad, and high-spirited on earth, against our happiness on earth. Immortality, granted to every Peter and Paul, has been the worst, the most vicious outrage on noble humanity ever. And let us not underestimate the calamity which, proceeding from Christianity, has insinuated itself even into politics. At present nobody any longer has the courage for separate rights, for rights of domination, for a feeling of reverence for himself and his equals, for pathos of distance. Our politics are morbid from this lack of courage. The aristocracy of character has been undermined most craftily by the lie of equality of souls. And if the belief in the privilege of the many makes revolutions and will continue to make them, it is Christianity, let us not doubt it, it is Christian valuations which translate every revolution merely into blood and crime. Christianity is a revolt of all that creeps on the ground against what is elevated. The gospel of the lowly makes Forty. low. The gospels are invaluable as evidence of the incessant corruption within the first congregation. What was later carried to a conclusion by Paul with the logical cynicism of a rabbi was nevertheless merely the process of decay which began with the death of the Saviour. These Gospels cannot be read too guardedly. There are difficulties behind every word. I confess, and I shall be pardoned for doing so, that to the psychologist they are a pleasure of the first rank for that very reason, as the antithesis to all naive depravity, as the refinement par excellence, as the artistic perfection in psychological depravity. The Gospels stand apart. The Bible, in general, admits of no comparison. One is among Jews, the chief point of view, so as not to lose all consistency. The dissembling of oneself into holiness, which here becomes downright genius, and has never been attained even approximately at any other time, either in books or among men, this false coinage in words and attitudes as an art— is not the accident of any individual endowment, of any exceptional nature. Race is required for it. In Christianity and its art of holy lying, the whole of Judaism, the most thoroughly earnest Jewish practice and technique of hundreds of years, attains its ultimate perfection. The Christian, this ultima ratio of the lie, is the Jew once more, even three times more. The will to use, as a matter of principle, only concepts, symbols, and attitudes which are established by the practice of the priest, the instinctive repudiation of every other practice, of every other mode of perspective with regard to value and utility, 
That is not only tradition, it is inheritance. It is only as inheritance that it operates as nature. The whole human race, even the best minds of the best ages, with one exception, who is perhaps merely a monster, have been deceived. The gospel has been read as the book of innocence. No small indication of the mastery with which the game has been played here. To be sure, if we got to see them, even if only in passing, all these whimsical hypocrites and artificial saints, the end would have come for them. And precisely because I never read a word without perceiving attitudes, I make an end of them. I cannot endure a certain way they have of opening their eyes. Fortunately, books for most people are merely literature. One must not be misled. Judge not, they say, but they send everything to hell which stands in their way. In making God judge, they themselves judge. In glorifying God, they glorify themselves. In demanding those virtues of which they themselves happen to be capable, yet more which they need in order to get the upper hand at all, they assume the grand airs of a wrestling for virtue, of a struggle for the triumph of virtue. We live, we die, we sacrifice ourselves for the good, truth, light, the kingdom of heaven. In fact, they do what they cannot help doing, in pressing themselves through all kinds of holes, in sitting in the corner, in living like shadows in the shade, like sneaking creatures, they make a duty out of it. Their life in humility appears to be a duty as humility. It is an additional proof of their piety. Ah, this humble, chaste, charitable kind of falsehood. For us, virtue itself shall bear witness. Let the Gospels be read as books of seduction by means of morality. Morality is arrested by these wretched people. They know of what consequence morality is. Mankind is best led by the nose with morality. The reality is that here the most conscious self-conceit of the elect plays the part of discretion. They have placed themselves, the congregation, the good and just, once and for all, on one side, on the side of truth, and the others, the world, on the other side. That has been the most fatal species of megalomania which has ever existed on earth. Wretched monsters of hypocrites and liars began to claim for themselves the concepts of God, truth, light, spirit, love, wisdom, life, as if they were synonyms of themselves in order to divide themselves in this way by a boundary line from the world. Wretched superlatives of Jews, ripe for every kind of madhouse, reversed the values altogether according to their own nature, as if only the Christian was the significance, the salt, the standard, and even the ultimate tribunal for all the rest. The whole calamity became possible only because there was already in the world a related, ethnologically related species of megalomania, the Jewish. Once the gap between the Jews and the Jewish Christians had opened up, no choice at all remained to the latter except to apply the procedures for self-maintenance advised by Jewish instinct against the Jews themselves while the Jews had, until then, applied them only against all that was non-Jewish. The Christian is only a Jew of a freer confession. I give a few examples of what these wretched people have taken into their heads, what they have put into the mouth of their master, nothing but confessions of beautiful souls. And whatsoever place shall not receive you and they hear you not as ye go forth thence. Shake off the dust that is under your feet, for a testimony unto them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Mark, chapter 6, verse 11. How evangelical!
And whosoever shall cause one of these little ones that believe on me to stumble, it were better for him if a great millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were cast into the sea. Mark chapter 9, verse 42. How evangelical! And if thine eye cause thee to stumble, cast it out. It is good for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Mark chapter 9, verse 47. It is not quite the eye that is alluded to. Verily I say unto you, There be some here of them that stand by, which shall in no wise taste of death, till they see the kingdom of God come with power. Mark chapter 9, verse 1. Well lied, lion. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For, remark of a psychologist, Christian morality is refuted by its force, its reasons refute, thus it is Christian. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Judge not that ye be not judged. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. What a conception of justice, of a just judge! For if ye love them that love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the Gentiles the same? Matthew chapter 5, verse 46. Principle of Christian love. It wants to be well paid in the end. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Matthew chapter 6, verse 15. Very compromising for the Father referred to. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things shall be added unto you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. All other things, namely food, clothing, all the necessities of life. An error modestly expressed. A little earlier, God appears as a tailor, at least in certain cases. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the same manner did their fathers unto the prophets. Luke chapter 6 verse 23. Impudent rabble, they already compare themselves to the prophets. Know ye not that ye are a temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man destroyeth the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Paul, 1 Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 16. Such utterances cannot be sufficiently despised. Or know ye not that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world is judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Paul, 1 Corinthians, chapter 6, verse 2. Alas, not merely the talk of a lunatic. This frightful deceiver continues as follows. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For seeing that in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom knew not God, it was God's good pleasure through the foolishness of the preaching to save them that believe. Not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God chose the foolish things of the world, that he might put to shame them that are wise. And God chose the weak things of the world, 
that he might put to shame the things that are strong, and the base things of the world, and the things that are despised did God choose, yea, and the things that are not, that he might bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory before God. Paul, 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 20. For the purpose of understanding this passage, a document of the very first rank for the psychology of all Chandala morality, the first essay of my Genealogy of Morals should be read. There, for the first time, the antithesis between a noble morality and a Chandala morality, born out of ressentiment and impotent revenge, was put forward. Paul was the greatest of all apostles of Rodensic. What follows from all this? That one does well to put on gloves when reading the New Testament. The proximity of so much uncleanliness almost compels one to do so. We would no more choose first Christians for companionship than Polish Jews, not that such an objection was required against them. Neither of them have a good smell. I have searched in vain in the New Testament for even a single sympathetic trait. There is nothing free, gracious, open-hearted, or upright in it. Humanity has not yet made its beginning here. The instincts of cleanliness are lacking. There are only bad instincts in the New Testament. There is no courage even for these bad instincts. Everything in it is cowardice. Everything is closing one's eyes to oneself and self-deception. Every book becomes clean when one has just read the New Testament. To give an example, immediately after Paul, I read Petronius with delight, that most charming and high-spirited mocker, of whom might be said what Domenico Boccaccio wrote to the Duke of Parma concerning Cesare Borgia, e tutto festo, immortally healthy, immortally cheerful and well-constituted. For these wretched hypocrites miscalculate in the main thing. They attack, but everything that is attacked by them is thereby distinguished. He who is attacked by a first Christian is not soiled. Reversely, it is an honor to have first Christians for enemies. The New Testament is not read without a predilection for that which is abused in it. To say nothing of the wisdom of this world— which an impudent boaster in vain sought to put to shame by a foolish sermon. But even the Pharisees and scribes gain an advantage from such antagonism. They must surely have been worth something to be hated in such an indecent manner. Hypocrisy! That is a reproach first Christians are allowed to make. In the end, the Pharisees and scribes were the privileged. That suffices. Chandala hatred needs no further reasons. The first Christian, I fear also the last Christian, whom I shall perhaps yet live to see, is, by fundamental instinct, a rebel against everything privileged. He lives for, he always struggles for, equal rights. Examined more exactly, he has no choice. If one personally wants to be one of the chosen of God, or a temple of God, or a judge of angels. Every other principle of selection, for example, according to integrity, according to intellect, according to manliness and pride, according to beauty and freedom of heart, is simply world, the evil in itself. Moral. Every expression in the mouth of a first Christian is a lie. Every action he does is an instinctive falsehood. All his values, all his aims are harmful, but whomever he hates, whatever he hates, has value. The Christian, the priestly Christian especially, is a criterion of values. Do I still have to say that in the whole New Testament there is only a single figure which one is obliged to honour? Pilate, the Roman governor. To take a Jewish affair seriously he will not be persuaded to do that. A Jew, more or less, what does that matter? The noble scorn of a Roman, before whom a shameless misuse of the word truth was carried on, 
has enriched the New Testament with the only expression which has value, which is itself its criticism, its annihilation. What is truth? What sets us apart is not that we do not rediscover any god, either in history or in nature or behind nature, but that we recognize what was worshipped as god not as divine, but as pitiable, as absurd, as harmful, not only as an error, but as a crime against life. We deny God as God. If this God of the Christians were proved to us, we should know even less how to believe in him. In a formula, God, as Paul created him, is a denial of God. A religion like Christianity, which is not in touch with actuality on any point, which immediately falls down as soon as actuality comes into its own, even in a single point, must, of course, be mortally hostile to the wisdom of the world, that is, to science. It will approve of all expedients by which discipline of intellect, integrity, and strictness in matters of intellectual conscience, the noble coolness and freedom of intellect, can be poisoned, calumniated, and defamed. Belief as an imperative is the veto against science. In practice, the lie at any price. Paul understood that the lie, the belief, was needed. Later, the church again understood Paul. The God whom Paul devised, a God who puts to shame the wisdom of the world, in the narrower sense, the two great opponents of all superstition, philology and medicine, is in fact only the resolute determination of Paul himself to do so. To call God one's own will, Torah, is truly Jewish. Paul wants to put to shame the wisdom of the world. His enemies are the good philologists and physicians of Alexandrian education. It is against them that he wages war. In fact, nobody can be a philologist and physician without, at the same time, being anti-Christian. For a philologist looks behind the holy books, a physician behind the physiological depravity of the typical Christian. The physician says, incurable, the philologist says, 48. fraud. Has the celebrated story, which stands at the commencement of the Bible, really been understood? The story of God's mortal terror of science. It has not been understood. This priest book par excellence begins appropriately with the great inner difficulty of the priest. He has only one great danger. Consequently, God has only one great danger. The old God, entire spirit, entire high priest, entire perfection, promenades in his garden. He only lacks a pastime. Even gods struggle in vain against tedium. What does he do? He invents man. Man is entertaining. But behold, man also lacks a pastime. The pity of God for the only distress which belongs to all paradises has no bounds. Straight away he created other animals as well. God's first mistake, man did not find the animals entertaining. He ruled over them, but did not even want to be an animal. God, consequently, created woman. And, in fact, there was now an end to tedium, but to other things also. Woman was God's second mistake. Woman is, in her essence, a serpent, Hira. Every priest knows that. From woman comes all the mischief in the world. Every priest knows that, likewise. Consequently, science also comes from her. Only through woman did man learn to taste of the tree of knowledge. What had happened? The old god was seized by a mortal terror. Man himself had become his greatest mistake. He had created a rival. Science makes godlike. It is all over with priests and gods if man becomes scientific. Moral. Science is the thing forbidden in itself. It alone is forbidden. Science is the first sin, the germ of all sin, original sin. 
This alone is morality. Thou shalt not know. The rest follows from this. God was not prevented from being shrewd by his mortal terror. How does one defend oneself against science? That was for a long time his main problem. Answer, away with man, out of paradise. Happiness and leisure lead to thoughts. All thoughts are bad thoughts. Man shall not think. And the priest in himself invents distress, death, the danger of life in pregnancy, every kind of misery, old age, weariness, and above all, sickness. Nothing but expedience in the struggle against science. Distress does not permit man to think. And nevertheless, frightful, the edifice of knowledge towers above, heaven-storming, dawning on the gods. What to do? The old god invents war. He separates the peoples. He brings it about that men mutually annihilate one another. The priests have always had need of war. War, among other things, is a great disturber of science. Incredible. Knowledge, the emancipation from the priest, increases even in spite of wars. And a final resolution is arrived at by the old god. Man has become scientific. There is no help for it. He must be drowned. I have been understood. The beginning of the Bible contains the entire psychology of the priest. The priest knows only one great danger, that is science, the sound concept of cause and effect. But science flourishes, on the whole, only under favorable circumstances. One must have superfluous time, one must have superfluous intellect in order to perceive. Consequently, man must be made unfortunate. This has at all times been the logic of the priest. One can already guess what has only thereby come into the world in accordance with this logic. Sin. The concepts of guilt and punishment, the whole moral order of the world, have been devised in opposition to science, in opposition to a severance of man from the priest. Man is not to look outwards, he is to look inwards into himself. He is not to look prudently and cautiously into things in order to learn. He is not to look at all. He is to suffer. And he is so to suffer as always to need the priest. Away with physicians. A saviour is needed. The concepts of guilt and punishment, inclusive of the doctrines of grace, of salvation and of forgiveness, lies through and through and without any psychological reality, have been invented to destroy the causal sense in man. They are an attack on the concepts of cause and effect, and not an attack with the fists, with the knife, with honesty and hate and love, but springing from the most cowardly, most deceitful and most ignoble instincts. A priest's attack, a parasite's attack a vampirism of pale, subterranean bloodsuckers. When the natural consequences of a deed are no longer natural, but are supposed to be brought about by the conceptual spectres of superstition, by God, by spirits, by souls, as mere moral consequences, as reward, punishment, suggestion, or means of education, then the prerequisite of perception has been destroyed. The greatest crime against mankind has been committed. Sin, to repeat once more, this form of human self-violation par excellence has been invented for the purpose of making science, culture, every kind of elevation and nobility of man impossible. The priest rules by the invention of Sin. sin. I do not, at this point, excuse myself from giving a psychology of belief of believers for the use, as is appropriate, of believers. If persons are still to be found today who do not know how indecent it is to be a believer, or how far it is a symbol of decadence, of a broken will to life, they will know it by tomorrow. My voice reaches even those who are hard of hearing. It appears, unless I have heard wrongly, that there is, among Christians, 
a kind of criterion of truth, which is called the proof by power. Belief makes blessed, therefore it is true. One might here object, in the first place, that the beatifying has not been proved, only promised. Blessedness has been united with the condition of believing. One is to become blessed, because one believes. But how could that be proved? That what the priest promises to the believer for the other world, inaccessible to all control, will actually happen? The alleged proof by power is thus again, after all, only a belief that the effect, which is supposed to follow from belief, will not fail to take place. In a formula, I believe that belief makes blessed, consequently it is true. But here we are already at an end. The consequently would be the absurdum itself as a criterion of truth. If we suppose, however, with some obsequiousness, that the beatifying by belief is proved, not only wished, not only promised, by the somewhat suspicious tongue of a priest, would blessedness, more technically expressed, delight, ever be a proof of truth? So little indeed that it almost provides the counter-proof. In any case, the strongest suspicion against truth— when feelings of delight have a voice in the question, what is true? The proof by delight is a proof of delight, that is all. How is it established for all the world that true judgments give more enjoyment than false ones, and have necessarily, according to a pre-established harmony, pleasant feelings in their train? The experience of all stern, profoundly constituted intellects teaches the reverse. Every step towards truth has had to be fought for, and whatever else human hearts, human love, human confidence in life are attached to, they have almost had to be abandoned for it. Therefore greatness of soul is required. The service of truth is the hardest service. What does it mean, then, to be honest in intellectual matters? to be stern with regard to one's heart, to despise fine feelings, to make oneself a conscience out of every yes and no. Belief makes blessed. Consequently, it lies. That belief, under certain circumstances, makes blessed, that bliss does not make a fixed idea true, that belief removes no mountains but places mountains where there are none, a hasty walk through a madhouse enlightens sufficiently on these matters. Not a priest, to be sure, for he denies by instinct that sickness is sickness, and a madhouse is a madhouse. Christianity needs sickness, almost as much as Hellenism needs a surplus of healthiness. Making sick is the true final purpose of the Church's whole system of salvation procedures, and the Church itself, is it not the Catholic madhouse as the ultimate ideal? Earth as nothing but a madhouse. Religious man, as the Church wishes him to be, is a typical decadent. The period when a religious crisis becomes master of a people is always distinguished by nervous epidemics. The inner world of religious man is too similar to the inner world of the overexcited and exhausted for any distinction to be made between the two. The highest states which Christianity has hung up over mankind as the most valuable of all values are forms of epilepsy. To the greater honour of God, the Church has canonised only crazed people or great deceivers. I once allowed myself to designate the whole Christian penitence and salvation training, which can be studied best in England at present, as a circular madness methodically produced, of course, upon a soil already prepared for it, that is, a thoroughly morbid soil. Nobody is free to become a Christian. One is not converted to Christianity. One must be morbid enough for it. We others, who have the courage for health and also for contempt, how we are permitted to despise a religion that teaches misunderstanding of the body— that does not want to get rid of the superstition of the soul, 
that makes a merit of insufficient nourishment, that combats in health a sort of enemy, devil, or temptation, that persuaded itself that a perfect soul could be carried about in a corpse of a body, and for that purpose needed to formulate a new concept of perfection, a pale, sickly, idiotic visionary condition so called holiness. Holiness itself merely a series of symptoms of an impoverished, enervated, and incurably ruined body. The Christian movement, as a European movement, has been, from the beginning, a collective movement of all kinds of outcast and refuse elements. In Christianity, this movement strives for power. It does not express the decay of a race. It is an aggregate formation of forms of decadence from everywhere which crowd together and seek one another. It was not, as is usually believed, the corruption of antiquity itself, of noble antiquity, that made Christianity possible. The learned idiocy, which even today maintains such a belief, cannot be contradicted with sufficient severity. At the time when the morbid, ruined Chandala classes of the whole imperium were Christianized, the counter-type, nobility, existed in precisely its finest and most mature form. The majority became master. The democratism of Christian instinct conquered. Christianity was not national. It was not racially conditioned. It appealed to every kind of person disinherited of life. It had its allies everywhere. Christianity has, at its basis, the grudge of the sick, the instinct opposed to the healthy, opposed to health. Everything well-constituted, proud, high-spirited, beauty above all, pains it in ear and eye. Once more I remind the reader of the invaluable expression of Paul, God has chosen the weak things of the world, the foolish things of the world, the base things of the world, and the things that are despised. That was the formula. Decadence conquered in this sign. God on the cross is the frightful concept behind this symbol not yet understood. All that suffers, all that hangs on the cross is divine. We all hang on the cross. Consequently, we are divine. We alone are divine. Christianity was a victory. A nobler type of character was destroyed by it. Christianity has been, up to now, the greatest misfortune of mankind. Christianity also stands in opposition to all intellectual well-constitutedness. It can only use morbid reason as Christian reason. It takes the part of everything idiotic, it pronounces a curse against intellect, against the pride of sound intellect. Because sickness belongs to the essence of Christianity, the typical Christian state, belief, must also be a form of sickness. All straight, upright, scientific paths to perception must be repudiated by the Church as forbidden paths. Doubt is already sin. The complete lack of psychological cleanliness in the priest, betraying itself in his look, is a phenomenon resulting from decadence. Hysterical women and children with rickety constitutions must be observed in respect to the frequency with which instinctive falsity, delight in lying for the sake of lying, incapacity for looking straight and walking straight, are expressions of decadence. Belief means not wishing to know what is true. The pietist, the priest of both sexes, is false because he is sick. His instinct is averse to truth, having its rights on any point. What makes sickly is good. What comes from fullness, from abundance, from power, is evil. That is what the believer feels. Compulsion to lie. In that I discover every predetermined theologian. Another mark of the theologian is his incapacity for philology. Philology here is meant to be understood as the art of reading well in a very general sense, to be able to read off facts without falsifying them by interpretation, without losing precaution, patience, and subtlety in the desire to understand. 
philology as indecision in interpretation, whether it be a question of books, newspapers, reports, events, or facts about the weather, not to speak of salvation of the soul. The way in which a theologian, it is all the same whether in Berlin or in Rome, explains an expression of scripture or an experience, a victory of his country's troops, for example, under the higher illumination of the Psalms of David, is always so daring that it makes the philologist run up a wall. And what in the world is he to do when pietists and other cows from Swabia transform, with the finger of God, the wretched commonplace and stuffiness of their lives into a miracle of grace, of providence, or of experience of salvation? The most modest expenditure of intellect, not to say of propriety, should certainly suffice to bring these interpreters to the conviction of the absolute childishness and unworthiness of such a misuse of divine manipulation. Even with a small amount of piety in ourselves, a God who cures us of Qatar at the right time, or who tells us to get into the carriage at the exact moment when a great rain commences, ought to be such an absurd God to us that he would have to be abolished, even if he existed. God as a domestic servant, as a postman, as an almanac-maker. After all, a word for the stupidest kind of accidents, divine providence, as it is still believed in by almost every third man in educated Germany, would be such an objection to God that a stronger one could not be thought of. And in any case, God is an objection to the Germans. 53. It is so little true that martyrs prove anything as to the truth of an affair that I would gladly deny that a martyr has ever had anything to do with truth. By the tone in which a martyr throws at people's heads what he takes to be true, such a low grade of intellectual integrity, such an obtuseness for the question of truth is expressed that a martyr never needs to be refuted. Truth is not a thing which one person might have and another might lack. Therefore, at best, peasants or peasant apostles like Luther can think concerning truth. One may be sure that proportionally to the grade of conscientiousness in intellectual matters, modesty, resignation on this point, always becomes greater. To know five things, and with dainty hand to decline to know anything else— truth, as the word is understood by every prophet, every sectarian, every free thinker, every socialist, every churchman, is a complete proof that as yet not even a beginning has been made on the intellectual discipline and self-overcoming which are needed for the finding of any small, ever so small, truth. The deaths of martyrs, by the way, have been a great misfortune in history. They have seduced the inference of all idiots, women and mob included, to the effect that a cause for which anyone lays down his life, or which, like primitive Christianity, even produces death-seeking epidemics, is of importance, this inference has become an unspeakable drag upon verification, upon the spirit of verification and precaution. The martyrs have injured truth. Even now, a crude form of persecution is all that is needed to create an honourable name for a sectarianism, no matter how indifferent in itself. What? Does it alter anything of the value of a cause if somebody lays down his life for it? An error which becomes honourable is an error which possesses an additional seductive charm. Do you think we would give you an opportunity, Monsieur the theologians, of being the martyrs for your lie? One refutes a thing by laying it respectfully on ice. It is just so that one also refutes theologians. It was precisely the grand historical stupidity of all persecutors that they gave an honourable aspect to the cause of their opponents, that they made a present to it of the fascination of martyrdom. Woman is still prostrate on her knees before an error, 
because she has been told that somebody has died for it on the cross. Is the cross then an argument? But with regard to all these matters, one man alone has said the word that has been needed for millennia, Zarathustra. Signs of blood have been written by them on the path they followed, and their folly taught that truth is proved by blood. But blood is the worst of all witnesses to truth. Blood poisons even the purest teaching, and turns it into delusion and hatred of hearts. And when a man goes through fire for his teaching, what is proved by that? Truly it is more when one's own teaching springs from one's own burning. Let nobody be led astray. Great intellects are sceptical. Zarathustra is a sceptic. Strength, freedom derived from the force and superior force of intellect, is proved by scepticism. Men of conviction do not even count in determining what is fundamental in value and non-value. Convictions are prisons. Such men do not see far enough. They do not see beneath themselves. But to be permitted to have a voice concerning value and non-value, one must see five hundred convictions beneath oneself, behind oneself. An intellect which wills what is great, which wills also the means to it, is necessarily sceptical. The freedom from every kind of conviction, the ability to look freely, belong to strength. Grand passion, the basis and power of a sceptic's existence, still more enlightened, still more despotic than himself, takes his whole intellect into its service. It makes him unscrupulous. It even gives him courage for unholy means. Under certain circumstances, it does not begrudge him convictions. Conviction as a means. Many things are attained only by means of conviction. Grand passion uses and uses up convictions. It does not subject itself to them. It knows itself to be sovereign. Conversely, the need of a belief, of something that is unconditioned by yes or no, Carlylism, if I shall be pardoned the word, is a requirement of weakness. The man of belief, the believer of every kind, is necessarily a dependent man. One who cannot posit himself as an end, who cannot, out of himself, posit ends at all. The believer does not belong to himself. He can only be a means. He must be used up. He needs somebody who will use him up. His instinct gives the highest honor to a morality of selflessness. Everything persuades him to it, his shrewdness, his experience, his vanity. Every kind of belief is itself an expression of selflessness, of self-estrangement. If it is considered how necessary for most people is a regulation which binds them from the outside and makes them secure, as coercion, slavery in a higher sense, is the sole and ultimate condition under which the weak-willed human being, especially woman, flourishes, conviction, belief, are understood. The man of conviction has it for his backbone, not to see many things, not to be unbiased, to be an interested party through and through, to have a strict and necessary perspective with regard to all values, these alone are the conditions for such a kind of man to exist. But he is thereby the antithesis, the antagonist of the truthful man, of truth. The believer is not at liberty to have a conscience at all about the questions of true and untrue. To be honest here would be his immediate ruin. The pathological conditionality of his perspective makes a fanatic out of a convinced person. Savonarola, Luther, Rousseau, Robespierre, Saint-Simon. The type antithetical to the strong, emancipated intellect. But the strong attitude of these morbid intellects, these conceptual epileptics, operates on the great masses. The fanatics are picturesque. Mankind prefers seeing postures to hearing reasons. A step further in the psychology of conviction, of belief. 
It is now a long time since the question was submitted by me for consideration whether convictions are not more dangerous enemies of truth than falsehoods. This time I should like to ask the decisive question. Does an antithesis between falsehood and a conviction exist at all? All the world believes it, but what is not believed by all the world? Every conviction has its history, its previous forms, its tentative shapes and mistakes. It becomes conviction after not having been so for a long time, after having hardly been so for a yet longer time. What? Could not falsehood also be among these embryonic forms of conviction? It sometimes needs merely a change of persons. In the son that becomes conviction which in the father was still falsehood. Not wishing to see something which one sees, not wishing so to see something as one sees it, that is what I call falsehood. It does not matter whether or not the lie takes place in the presence of witnesses. The most common falsehood is that by which one deceives oneself. The deception of others is a relatively exceptional case. Now, this not wishing to see what one sees, this not wishing so to see as one sees, is almost the first condition for all who are party in any sense whatsoever. The party man becomes a liar by necessity. German historiography, for example, is convinced that Rome was despotism, that the Teutons brought the spirit of freedom into the world. What is the difference between this conviction and a lie? Need one yet wonder if, by instinct, all parties, inclusive of German historians, have the sublime words of morality in their mouths? That morality almost continues to exist because party men of all kinds have need of it every hour. This is our conviction. We confess it before all the world. We live and die for it. Respect all who have convictions. I have even heard the same out of the mouths of anti-Semites. On the contrary, gentlemen, an anti-Semite by no means becomes more decent because he lies on principle. The priests, who in such matters are more refined and understand very well the objection which lies in the concept of a conviction, that is, a mendacity that is principled because it serves the purpose, have obtained from the Jews the policy of inserting in its place the concepts God, will of God, revelation of God. Kant also, with his categorical imperative, was on the same road. His reason became practical in this matter. There are questions in which the decision concerning truth or untruth does not appertain to man. All the highest questions, all the highest problems of value, are beyond human reason. To understand the limits of reason, only that is genuine philosophy. To what end did God give man revelation? Would God have done anything superfluous? Man cannot know of himself what is good and evil. On that account, God taught him his will. Moral, the priest does not lie. The question of true or untrue in such matters as priests speak about does not permit of lying at all. For in order to be able to lie, one would have to be able to determine what is true here. But that is just what man cannot do. The priest is thus only the mouthpiece of God. Such a priestly syllogism is by no means exclusively Jewish or Christian. The right to lie and the policy of revelation belong to the type of the priest, to the priests of decadence as well as of paganism. Pagans are all who say yes to life, to whom God is the word for the great yes to everything. Law will of God, the holy book, inspiration, all only words for the conditions under which the priest comes to power, by which he maintains his power. These concepts are found at the basis of every priestly organization, of every hierarchic or philosopho-hierarchic structure.
the holy falsehood, common to Confucius, to the law book of Manu, to Mohammed, to the Christian church, is not absent in Plato. Truth is here. This means that wherever it becomes audible, the priest is lying. Finally, it is of importance to what end is their lying. That holy ends are lacking in Christianity is my objection to its means. Only bad ends, poisoning, calumniating, and denying of life, despising of body, abasement and self-violation of man through the concept of sin, consequently its means are also bad. With an entirely different feeling, I read the law book of Manu, an incomparably intellectual and superior work, which it would be a sin against the spirit even to name in the same breath as the Bible. It is clear at once. It has an actual philosophy behind it, in it, not a mere bad-smelling Jewish acidity of rabbinism and superstition. It gives even the most fastidious psychologist something to bite on. Not forgetting the main thing, the fundamental difference from every kind of Bible, it is the means by which the noble classes, the philosophers and the warriors, stretch out their hands over the multitude. Noble values everywhere, a feeling of perfection, an affirmation of life, a triumphant feeling of well-being in oneself and in life. Sunshine spreads over the entire book. All the things which Christianity takes as objects of its unfathomable vulgarity, for example, procreation, woman, marriage, are treated seriously here with reverence, love, and confidence. How can one really put a book into the hands of children and women which contains those vile words, Because of fornications, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband, for it is better to marry than to burn? And is it allowable to be a Christian as long as the origin of man is Christianized, that is, dirtied with the concept of the Immaculate Conception. I know of no book in which so many delicate and kind things are said of woman as in the law book of Manu. Those old greybeards and saints have a way of being gracious towards women, which perhaps has not been surpassed. The mouth of a woman, the book says at one point, the bosom of a maiden, the prayer of a child— the smoke of sacrifice, are always pure. Another passage. There is nothing purer than the light of the sun, the shadow of a cow, air, water, fire, and the breath of a maiden. A last passage, perhaps also a holy lie. All openings of the body above the navel are pure, all under it are impure. Only in a maiden is the whole body pure. The unholiness of Christian means is surprised in flagranti, when for once the Christian purpose is measured by the purpose of the law book of Manu. When this great antithesis of purpose is put under a strong light, the critic of Christianity cannot help making Christianity contemptible. Such a law book as that of Manu originates like every good law book. It sums up the experience, the policy, and the experimental morality of long centuries. It finishes, it no longer creates. The prerequisite for a codification of that kind is the insight that the means for creating authority for a truth, slowly and expensively acquired, are fundamentally different from those with which one would prove it. A law book never recounts the advantage, the reasons, the casuistry in the previous history of a law, for in that way it would lose its imperative tone, the thou shalt, the prerequisite for its being obeyed. The problem lies precisely in this. At a certain point in the development of a nation, its most enlightened class, that is, the most retrospective and prospective, declares the experience according to which people are to live, that is, according to which they can live, to be settled. 
Its aim is to bring home from the times of experiment and unfortunate experience the richest and most complete harvest possible. Consequently, what is to be avoided above all is the continuation of experimenting, the continuation of the fluid condition of values, testing, choosing, and criticizing of values in infinitum. A double wall is established in opposition to this. On the one hand, revelation, that is, the assertion that the reason for those laws is not of human origin, not wearisomely sought out and found after many mistakes, but of divine origin, entire, perfect, without a history, a gift, a miracle, a mere communication. On the other hand, tradition, that is, the assertion that the law has already existed since primitive times, that it is impious, that it is a crime against the ancestors to call it into question. The authority of the law is established by the thesis, God gave it, the ancestors lived under it. The higher reason of such procedure lies in the intention of thrusting back the consciousness step by step from the mode of life recognized as correct, that is, proved by an immense and finely sifted experience, so that a perfect automatism of instinct is attained, the prerequisite for every kind of mastery, for every kind of perfection in the art of life. To draw up a law book like that of Manu means the concession to a people to become in future masterly, perfect, to exercise ambition for the highest art of life. For that end, it must be made unconscious, that is, the object of all holy lies. The order of castes, the highest, the dominating law, is only the sanction of an order of nature, natural lawfulness of the first rank over which no arbitrariness, no modern idea, has power. In every healthy society, three types, mutually conditioning and differently gravitating, physiologically separate themselves, each of which has its own hygiene, its own domain of labor, its own special sentiment of perfection, its own special mastery. Nature, not Manu, separates from one another the mainly intellectual individuals the individuals mainly excelling in muscular strength and temperament, and the third class neither distinguished in the one nor in the other, the mediocre individuals, the latter as the great number, the former as the select individuals. The highest caste, I call them the fewest, has, as the perfect caste, the privileges of the fewest. To them belongs the right to represent happiness, beauty, goodness on earth. Only the most intellectual men are permitted beauty, beautiful things. It is only with them that goodness is not weakness. Pulcrum est paucorum hominum. The good is a privilege. On the other hand, nothing is more strictly forbidden to them than unpleasant manners or a pessimistic outlook an eye that makes ugly, or even indignation with regard to the whole aspect of things. Indignation is the privilege of the chandala, and pessimism similarly. The world is perfect, thus speaks the instinct of the most intellectual men, the affirmative instinct. Imperfection, every kind of inferiority to us, distance, pathos of distance, even the chandala belong to this perfection. The most intellectual men, as the strongest, find their happiness in that in which others would find their ruin, in the labyrinth, in severity towards themselves and others, in effort. Their delight is in self-constraint. With them, asceticism becomes naturalness, requirement, instinct. A difficult task is regarded by them as a privilege, to play with burdens which crush others to death as a recreation, knowledge, a form of asceticism. They are the most venerable kind of man. That does not exclude their being the most cheerful, the most amiable. They rule, not because they want to, but because they are. They are not at liberty to be the second in rank. 
The second in rank are the guardians of right, the keepers of order and security, the noble warriors, the king as the highest formula of warrior, judge, and keeper of the law. The second in rank are the executive of the most intellectual, the most closely associated with them, relieving them of all that is coarse in the work of ruling, their retinue, their right hand, their best disciples. In all that, to repeat it once more, there is nothing arbitrary, nothing artificial. What is different from this is artificial. Nature is put to shame by what is different. By the order of castes, the order of rank, only the supreme law of life itself is formulated. The separation of the three types is necessary for the maintenance of society, for the making possible of higher and highest types. The inequality of rights is the very condition of their being rights at all. A right is a privilege. In his mode of existence, everyone has his privilege. Let us not undervalue the privileges of the mediocre. Life always becomes harder towards the summit. The cold increases, responsibility increases. A high civilization is a pyramid. It can only stand upon a broad base. It has, for a first prerequisite, a strongly and soundly consolidated mediocrity. Handicraft, trade, agriculture, science, the greater part of art, in a word, the whole compass of business activity, is exclusively compatible with an average amount of ability and pretension. The same pursuits would be displaced among the elite. The instinct appropriate to them would contradict aristocracy as well as anarchy. There is a determination of nature that a person should be a public utility, a wheel, a function. It is not society. It is the kind of happiness of which the larger number alone are capable, which makes intelligent machines out of them. For the mediocre, it is a happiness to be mediocre. For them, the mastery in one thing, specialism, is a natural instinct. It would be altogether unworthy of a more profound intellect to see an objection in mediocrity itself. It is indeed the first necessity for the possibility of exceptions. A high civilization is conditioned by it. If the exceptional man just treats the mediocre with a more delicate touch than himself and his equals, it is not mere courtesy of heart. It is simply his duty. Whom do I hate most among the mob of the present day? The socialist mob, the Chandler apostles who undermine the working man's instinct, his pleasure, his feeling of contentedness with his petty existence, who make him envious, who teach him revenge. The wrong never lies in unequal rights. It lies in the pretension to equal rights. What is bad? But I said it already, all that springs from weakness, from envy, from revenge, the anarchist and the Christian are of the same origin. In fact, it makes a difference for what purpose a person lies, whether he preserves with it or destroys with it. One may assert a perfect equivalence between the Christian and the anarchist. Their object, their instinct, is towards destruction. The proof of this proposition can be read plainly from history. It is contained in history with frightful distinctness. If we just now became acquainted with a religious legislation whose object was to make eternal the highest condition for making life flourish a great organization of society, Christianity, on the other hand, found its mission in putting an end to just such an organization— because life flourished in it. There the proceeds of reason from long periods of experiment and uncertainty were intended to be invested for the most remote advantage, and the harvest was intended to be brought home as large, as rich, and as complete as possible. Here, reversely, the harvest was blighted during the night. That which stood there ire perennius, the imperium romanum, the grandest form of organization under difficult conditions that has hitherto been achieved, 
in comparison with which everything previous, everything subsequent, is patchwork, bungling, and dilettantism, those holy anarchists have made a piety out of destroying the world that is, the Imperium Romanum, until no stone remained upon another, until even Teutons and other ruffians could become master over it. The Christian and the anarchist, both decadents, both incapable of operating in any way other than disintegrating, blighting, stunting, blood-sucking, both exhibiting the instinct of mortal hatred of whatever stands, whatever is great, whatever has durability, whatever promises futurity to life. Christianity was the vampire of the Imperium Romanum. In the night it has undone the immense achievement of the Romans, who obtained the site for a grand civilization that would require time. Is it not yet understood? The Imperium Romanum, which we know, which the history of the Roman province always teaches us to know better, that most admirable work of art of the grand style, was a beginning. Its structure was calculated to prove itself by millennia. Up till now, there has never been such a building. No building of a similar magnitude has even been dreamt of. This organization was steadfast enough to endure bad emperors. The accident of persons must have nothing to do with such matters, first principle of all great architecture. But it was not steadfast enough against the most corrupt kind of corruption, against the Christian, these stealthy vermin which in darkness, obscurity, and duplicity approached every individual, sucking out of him the seriousness for true things, the whole instinct for realities, that cowardly, feminine, and honeyed crew have gradually estranged the souls from that immense edifice. Those valuable, those manly, noble natures, who felt the cause of Rome to be their own cause, their own seriousness, their own pride. Hypocrite, sneaking, conventicle secrecy, gloomy concepts such as hell, the sacrifice of the innocent, the mystical union in blood-drinking, above all the slowly stirred-up fire of revenge, of chandala revenge, that became master over Rome, the same kind of religion against the pre-existent form of which Epicurus had waged war. Let a person read Lucretius to understand what Epicurus opposed, not paganism, but Christianity, that is, the depravity of souls by the concepts of guilt, punishment, and immortality. He opposed the subterranean cults, the whole of latent Christianity. To deny immortality was then a real salvation, and Epicurus would have conquered. Every respectable intellect in the Roman Empire was Epicurean. Then Paul appeared. Paul, the incarnated, genius-inspired Chandala hatred against Rome, against the world, the Jew, the eternal Jew par excellence. What he found out was how to light a universal conflagration with the aid of the small sectarian Christian movement on the edge of Judaism, how to sum up to a prodigious power by the symbol of God on the cross all the inferior, all the secretly seditious, the whole heritage of the anarchist intrigues in the empire. Salvation is of the Jews. Christianity as a formula for outbidding and summing up all kinds of subterranean cults, like those of Osiris, of the Great Mother, of Mithras, for example. Paul's genius consists in discerning this. His instinct was so certain in this that, with regardless violence to truth, he put the ideas with which those Chandala religions fascinated into the mouth of the saviour of his own invention, and not only into the mouth, that he made something out of him which a Mithras priest could also understand. That was his Damascus moment. 
he understood that he needed the belief in immortality in order to depreciate the world, that the concept of hell becomes master even of Rome, that life is killed by the other world, nihilist and Christian. They rhyme in German, and do not only rhyme. The whole labor of the ancient world in vain. I have no words to express my sentiments with regard to something so hideous, and considering that its work was a preparation, that only the substructure was laid with granite self-consciousness for the work of millennia, the entire meaning of the ancient world in vain. Why did the Greeks exist? Why did the Romans? All the prerequisites for a learned civilization all scientific methods were already there. The great, the incomparable art of reading well had already been established. That prerequisite to the tradition of civilization, to the unity of science. Natural science in alliance with mathematics and mechanics were on the best of all paths. The sense for facts, the last and most valuable of all senses, had its schools and its tradition already centuries old. Is that understood? Everything essential had been discovered to enable people to go to work. The methods, it must be repeated ten times, are the essential thing. Also the most difficult thing, as well as the things that have habit and indolence against them longest. What we have now won back for ourselves with unspeakable self-constraint, for somehow we all still have bad instincts, Christian instincts in our nature, the open look in presence of reality, the cautious hand, patience and earnestness in details, all the integrity in knowledge, it was already there, already more than two thousand years ago, and added to that the excellent refined tact and taste, not as brain training not as German culture with boorish manners, but as body, as bearing, as instinct, in a word, as reality, all in vain. Come tomorrow merely a memory. The Greeks, the Romans, nobility of instinct, taste, methodical investigation, genius for organization and administration, the belief in, the will to a future for man, the great yes to all things visible as the Imperium Romanum, visible to all senses, the grand style, no longer merely art, but become reality, truth, life, and choked in the night, not by any natural accident, not trampled down by Teutons and other heavy-footed creatures, but put to shame by crafty, secretive, invisible, anemic vampires, not conquered, only sucked out. Hidden vindictiveness, petty envy become master. Everything wretched, suffering from itself, visited by bad feelings. The entire ghetto world of the soul suddenly on top. One has only to read any Christian agitator, St. Augustine, for instance, to be able to smell what dirty fellows have come out on top. One would be thoroughly deceived by presupposing any lack of understanding in the leaders of the Christian movement. Oh, they are shrewd, shrewd even to holiness, Monsieur the Fathers of the Church. What they lack is something quite different. Nature neglected them. It forgot to give them a modest dowry of respectable, decent, cleanly instincts. In confidence, they are not even men. If Islam despises Christianity, it has a thousand times the right to do so. Islam has men for a prerequisite. 60. Christianity has robbed us of the harvest of ancient civilization. It has again, later, robbed us of the harvest of the culture of Islam the wonderful world of Moorish civilization in Spain, on the whole more closely related to us, speaking more to sense and taste than Rome and Greece, was trampled down. I do not say by what sort of feet. Why? 
because it owed its origin to noble, to manly instincts, because it said yes to life, even with the rare and refined jewels of Moorish life. The Crusaders, later, fought against something before which it might have been better for them to lie in the dust, a civilization in comparison with which even our nineteenth century might appear very poor to itself, very late. To be sure, they wanted to gain booty. The Orient was rich. Let us not be biased. Crusades, superior piracy, that is all. German nobility, a Viking nobility at bottom, was there in its element. The Church knew only too well what German nobility is attracted by. The German noble, always the Swiss guard of the Church, always in the service of all the bad instincts of the Church, but well paid. It is precisely with the aid of German swords, German blood and courage, that the Church has carried through its mortally hostile warfare against everything noble upon earth. There are, at this point, a great number of painful questions. German nobility is scarcely to be met with in the history of higher civilization. The reason is obvious. Christianity, alcohol, the two great means of corruption. For in itself there should be no choice in the face of Islam and Christianity, as little as in the face of an Arab and a Jew. The decision is given. Nobody is still free to choose here. Either a person is a Chandler, or he is not. War to the knife with Rome, peace, friendship with Islam. This is what that the great free spirit, the genius among the German emperors, Frederick the Second, felt. This is what he did. What? Does a German have to be first a genius, to be first a free spirit in order to have decent feelings? I do not understand how a German could ever feel Christian. Here it is necessary to touch upon a reminiscence, a hundred times more painful for Germans. The Germans have caused Europe the loss of the last great harvest of civilization that was to be garnered for Europe, the Renaissance. Is it at last understood, is it desired to be understood, what the Renaissance was? the transvaluation of Christian values, the attempt undertaken with all means, with all instincts, with all genius, to bring about the triumph of the opposite values, the noble values. There has only been this great war up to now. Up to now there has been no more decisive question than the Renaissance. My question is its question. Neither has there ever been a form of attack more fundamental, more direct, more strenuously delivered, with a whole front upon the centre of the enemy? To attack at the most decisive place, at the seat of Christianity itself, to set the noble values upon the throne in this respect, that is, to introduce them into the most radical requirements and longings of those sitting there— I see before me the possibility of a perfectly supernatural enchantment and colour charm. It seems to me to shine with a trembling of refined beauty. It seems that there is an art at work in it, so divine, so devilishly divine, that one might seek for millennia in vain for a second example of such a possibility. I see a spectacle so ingenious, so wonderfully paradoxical at the same time, that all the divinities of Olympus would have had an occasion for immortal laughter. Cesare Borgia as Pope, am I understood? Well, that would have been the triumph which only I am longing for at present. Christianity would thereby have been done away with. What happened? A German monk, Luther, came to Rome. This monk, with all the vindictive instincts of an abortive priest in his nature, became furious against the Renaissance in Rome. Instead of, with the most profound gratitude, understanding the tremendous event that had taken place, the overcoming of Christianity at its seat, his hatred only knew how to draw its nourishment from this spectacle, 
a religious person thinks only of himself. Luther saw the depravity of popery, while the very reverse was palpable. The old depravity, the original sin Christianity, no longer sat on the throne of the Pope, but life, the triumph of life, the great yes to all things high, beautiful, and daring. And Luther restored the Church once more. He attacked it. The Renaissance, an event without meaning, a great in vain. Oh, those Germans! What they have already cost us. In vain, that has always been the work of the Germans. The Reformation, Leibniz, Kant, and so-called German philosophy. The wars of liberation, the empire. Every time an in vain for something that had already existed, for something irrecoverable. They are my enemies, I confess it, these Germans. In despising them, I despise every kind of uncleanliness in concepts and values, every kind of cowardice in the presence of every straightforward yes and no. They have tangled and confused for almost a thousand years. Whatever they laid their fingers on, they have on their conscience all the half-heartedness, the three-eighths heartedness, from which Europe is sick. They also have on their conscience the foulest kind of Christianity, the most incurable, the most irrefutable that exists, Protestantism. If we never get rid of Christianity, the Germans will be to blame for it. With this, I am at the conclusion and pronounce my sentence. I condemn Christianity. I bring against the Christian Church the most terrible of all accusations that ever an accuser has taken into his mouth. To me, it is the greatest of all imaginable corruptions. It has had the will to the ultimate corruption that is at all possible. The Christian Church has left nothing untouched with its depravity. It has made a worthlessness out of every value, a lie out of every truth, a baseness of soul out of every kind of integrity. Let a person still dare to speak to me of its humanitarian blessings. To do away with any state of distress, whatever, was counter to its most profound expediency. It lived by states of distress. It created states of distress in order to perpetuate itself eternally. The worm of sin, for example. It is only the Church that has enriched mankind with this state of distress. The equality of souls before God, this falsehood, this pretense for the grudge of all the base-minded, this explosive concept which has finally become revolution, modern idea and decadence principle of the whole order of society, is Christian dynamite. Humanitarian blessings of Christianity. To breed out of humanity a self-contradiction, an art of self-violation, a will to the lie at any price, a repugnance, a contempt for all good and honest instincts. Those are for me the blessings of Christianity. Parasitism as the sole practice of the Church, draining away all blood, all love, all hope for life, with its anemic ideal of holiness. The other world as the will to the negation of every reality. The cross as the rallying sign for the most subterranean conspiracy that has ever existed, against health, beauty, well-constitutedness, courage, intellect, benevolence of soul, against life itself. I shall write this eternal accusation against Christianity on every wall, wherever there are walls. I have letters for making even the blind see. I call Christianity the one great curse, the one great intrinsic depravity, the one great instinct of revenge for which no expedient is sufficiently poisonous, secret, subterranean, mean. I call it the one immortal blemish of mankind.